Hello, people, and welcome to the show. My guest today is a drummer for one of the hottest bands on the prog scene right now. He's the drummer for Bent Knee, and this episode was mostly talking about pop culture. Uh, we got pretty heavy and serious uh, talking about the the state of uh, the core of the American psyche, but mostly it was just two friends just shooting the shit, having a good time. So please enjoy my conversation with the great and powerful Gavin Wallace Aylesworth. <laughs> Two, one, and we're live-ish. You know, we'll do it live. Gavin, how you doing, man? Not too bad. How about you? It's it's been time. it's been so long since I talked to you. It's been I ages. Know. Long time no talk. Yeah, it's it's it hasn't been uh, twenty four hours or anything like that. Yeah, it it's I don't still have access to uh, uh, Sonic the Hedgehog the movie. <laughs> So, uh, Batman Forever, you wanted to argue with me about that. Uh, yeah, I think Batman Forever, while certainly not as good as Batman Returns or Batman or uh, uh, The Dark Knight, uh, I think Batman Forever is a pretty stable little little uh, little cheesy film. I mean, I, I think it's fun. I think it's a... I enjoy the movie. I don't have anything that I would say is egregiously wrong with it like i enjoy watching it it's just yeah. i so when i'm looking at the uh the riddler as a character as we discussed um I'm, I'm comparing it to what i think is the strongest interpretation of the character like the best decision you could make artistically yeah. uh i think that jim carrey just being jim carrey as a dastardly villain is a fun artistic choice as evidenced by sonic the hedgehog that we watched yesterday uh <laughs> he's playing yeah. largely the same character i'm so much smarter than you and i'm jim carrey and i'm going to thrust around and act weird and dance like he played the same character yeah and Which... so it's a fun character, but um, when I'm looking at, like, what is the best interpretation of the Riddler, um, I'm looking at Batman the Animated Series and what they did with the character in those episodes there. And yeah. so when I'm looking at what is going to... The Riddler is essentially a character who's all about mind games and how mm -hmm. he can prove that he's uh, superior through uh, intellectual challenges. And I felt that Jim Carrey was just sort of playing the Joker and just calling him the Riddler. Well, I, I think... He was going. He was modeling himself more after the Frank Gorshin, you know, the live action '66. Right. Uh, but yeah. I, I. But I think. Uh, I think it's better to model yourself after like what is the the source material in the comics rather than Frank yeah. Gorshin. And also, I think that um, it draws too many parallels to Frank Gorshin by being that close to his performance. Mm. Uh, versus Jack Nicholson versus Cesar Romero are just different takes on the character. Oh, um, completely. Yeah. Uh, but the thing is, like, even though I don't think it's the right interpretation of the character, um, I still respect it. I still enjoy it. And it's not, like, so off-base where it's like, oh, man, you missed the essence of the character. It's, it's just... not like Tommy Lee Jones as Two-Face. Right, uh, as Two-Face. Two <laughs> where it's just, like, there's... The character's not even there. It's just... Yeah. Um, yeah. So with Jim Carrey, it's like... I, it's more like a mixed feeling, like, oh, I think that there's a stronger way you could have interpreted the Riddler in this film. However, what we got was still a very enjoyable and a respectable take. I'll agree with that. I'll, I'll, yeah. Yeah. Okay. The thing is, hot take Troy is not that hot when I just bother to explain <laughs> my opinions. Yeah. Like Jim Carrey could it's have fair. made a better artistic choice with this. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's certainly, uh, it's, it's certainly, not as transcendent a performance as like Danny DeVito as, as Penguin and, you know, or, uh, uh, Jack Nicholson's Joker is phenomenal. Right. Uh, of course, Heath Ledger, you know? Yeah. And I think that, uh, Heath Ledger is sort of the peak for the live action genre. And I feel like anyone who says Nicholson is just saying that with nostalgia. Like it's never a younger person who says yeah, Nicholson no, is fair. the best. It's always like, no nah, man, it's Nicholson and Keaton only. I'm like, I mean, don't get me wrong. Like th those are great. And actually I will give, a, there's more credibility to Keaton being the best Batman. I can see that argument more, but yeah. like anyone who's just like, man, Nicholson was so much better than Ledger. I'm like, are you sure? Are you really yeah, sure no, I that gotta... Jack Nicholson just being Jack Nicholson? 
like like certain people were just like doing their shtick. Like Jack Nicholson was like, oh, so I need to play like a a, a crazy person who like slowly goes unhinged. Yeah, I, I can see if I can twist that. <laughs> you know. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, that's 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 a very good point. Um, of course. Uh, but the yeah, Devito as Penguin is, is great. Oh yeah. Yeah, DeVito's Penguin is is amazing, but but of course we're both forgetting about the one true Joker. Uh, the I haven't seen that movie, so I don't know if I uh, I'll uh, haven't can't fully judge it. Only seen Jared clubs. Leto as yeah. as no, I'm kidding. I, I I haven't seen it either, but I have seen a couple scenes with him in it, and it does not uh, does not seem very good to me. Yeah, the film does does not bode well. But as we know, we shouldn't judge art before we consume it. No, that's that's true. That's true. Although uh, you can make like an educated guess, you can, and and I mean, I certainly when I first saw the look of Leto's Joker uh, or Leto, is it Leto, Jared Leto, or Jared Leto? Jared I Leto, I believe. It's that's right. It's Jared Leto, and it's uh, Duke Leto Atreides in Dune. Uh, but but Jared Leto, uh, I, I was not impressed when I saw the look of that Joker, and then I saw a couple of the scenes that he was in, and it just, I, I have no drive to consume that particular piece of art. But, you know, th- that's sort of the trick with a lot of these, um, especially with Batman castings, mm-hmm. is that there's always a degree of skepticism, because they always go with, like, unexpected choices. Well, not always, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of unexpected a lot, choices yeah. that have turned out to be home runs. Like, people thought, oh man, Keaton is Batman, I'm going to boycott the movie, it's going to exactly. be campy and stupid, and yeah. then, you know, Keaton was great. Uh, Heath Ledger as the Joker. Oh, that pretty boy from A Knight's Tale and Ten Things I Hate About You? You know, there's I was no... one of those guys, yeah. I was one of those, like, what, they got the Ten Things I Hate About You guy playing, playing the Joker? Oh, uh, and Batman Begins was so good, they're going to follow it up with this? And then it turned out to be uh, amazing. And I, and I I actually wasn't one of those guys. And I was like, guys, do you remember how everyone complained about Keaton and he was great? There's probably yeah. a reason why Ledger was cast. If they're going for the Joker on the second movie, they probably have a pretty damn good idea of what they want to do with the character. And if yeah. they're going to cast this guy, he can probably do it. Uh, and so, like, I trusted Chris Nolan and his judgment. And I... <sighs> I looked at, you know, the historical context of like, okay, no one trusted Keaton and he was great. This yeah. will probably be amazing and will be a genre defining performance. So I was right about that. Um, yeah. And then with Jared Leto, I'm like, well, wait, hold on. This also <laughs> seems bad, but also history has proven that these ideas that seem bad can turn good. However, I feel like this won't be the case and that this will yeah. actually be the one that was bad. And from what everyone says, I was right about that. But yeah. I remember uh, Joe Starr from Screen Joke. He's like, guys, this will probably be amazing. Think about all the other times they did stuff we thought would be shitty and then it wasn't. And then it's like, <laughs> oh, well, this time it actually was shitty. Well, and then we're forgetting about that other great Joker performance, uh, which is uh... – Oh, this this joke would come off funnier if I could remember the actor's name. Uh, uh, Lex Luthor from uh, from BVS, Batman v Superman. Oh, Jesse what, Eisenberg. What, Jesse Eisenberg I as lo- Lex Luthor. I thought that was actually a good take on the character. Um, oh. Well, because okay, think of it this way: like the yeah, if you th- this is how I I view. It. So I like certain parts of BVS. Parts of it I think are trash, but. There's still, like, two hours of good movies, so any movie that's, like, two hours of good movie, I'm like, you know what, that's probably a good movie. Even if it's two hours and 30 minutes, and 30 minutes of the movie is trash, that's yeah. still, like, two hours is enough to say that was a good movie for me, typically. <laughs> um, and so I view him as, like, um, as a Mark Zuckerberg kind of character. Like, if you're thinking, who are the modern villains today? It's all the dudes in Silicon Valley and all those tech gurus who do the up speak. And they're like, Hey buddy, I'm going to, you know, have a foosball table, you know, in the break room. Aren't I the cool CEO? And, (laughs) uh, you know, I'm going to trick you into working here at all hours of the day because I've got a foosball table and we've got snacks. So you won't mind working an 80 hour week. A champ, get to work on that software for me. Um, yeah. And so, because the traditional Lex Luthor character, who, who is he? He is a, he was a, like a, a big, muscular, bald guy 
and just like another Jap dude. Have you said like these three just Jap dudes hanging out? Bar like, hey, I'm Lex Luthor. I'm Batman. I'm Superman. Just these three like super buff dudes like all being like mine's bigger. Um, <laughs> I think that having him be like that allowed him to be a foil to both Batman and Superman in the movie by making him physically weak versus these two muscular guys. I think that offered him as a good foil to them. A, oh, yeah, a good but... modern contextualization of the character. Um, yeah. And I I respected his... I thought the performance worked. I didn't think it was necessarily a Joker copy per se. I thought it was, you know, splitting the difference between uh, Jim Carrey's Riddler and what the Riddler should be. <laughs> it was uh, somewhere in the middle there. Yeah. Okay. So I, for me, that interpretation worked because I've already seen, like, classic Lex Luthor in a number yeah. of media. Um and even though that sort of negated my Riddler argument of saying, oh, Jim Carrey should have done that, we've already <laughs> had several different Lex Luthors on screen that are more faithful to the comic. So oh, yeah. it's like, you yeah. know what? Mix it up, and I think it worked well, especially when you're looking at like what that Bruce Wayne was. Like He was basically very similar to a Lex Luthor, and otherwise they would have been essentially the same character. Yeah, no, that, that could have been true, but I think that also speaks to... <laughs> the way that Zack Snyder views Batman and Superman. You know uh, what I mean? Because he, he, Zack Snyder... He has a valid take, though. I think he's he's back with, like, 1980s yeah. Batman and Superman, which is like, hey, if that's, like, the shit you're into, like, the, what, the dude who likes Watchmen was into The Dark Knight Returns? No way, bro. Well, hey, no, I love... Dark Knight Returns is one of my favorite Batman stories. I, I just think that... that Snyder, to me, it is... It, You're saying objectivism he, might not be as trendy in the decade of Trump. Well, well <laughs> I, I'm, <laughs> really what I'm saying is that Zack Snyder wishes he was Frank Miller so bad and just isn't, but will keep trying. Uh, uh, you know, I, I both his Justice League and, and his, his Batman v Superman, you know... Uh, I think are such kind of trying to get that, that Frank Miller flavor. Uh, but it just isn't, isn't happening. <laughs> I feel, well, I feel like justice league was just a, a complete failure, but I'm interested in the Snyder cut to see where the vision goes. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I'm, I'm curious. I mean, I'm sure I will see it. I, I imagine uh, it's going to be, here's what I would expect. I don't think you'll yeah. like it, but I think you'll find it to be leaps and bounds better than the other Justice League, and at least a work of art where you'll be like, okay, I get what you were going for, as with yeah. the Justice League, which was just, like, bland a and felt limp. Total nightmare, yeah. But I don't know, I think that, I feel like with BVS, it was him, like, carving out his own niche where it was clear his influences, but also clear his own direction on it. And, like, for me... That worked as just another good interpretation of the characters. I felt that, um, you know, I've, the extended cut obviously gives much more character beats for Superman as a character. Um, oh, and I haven't seen, I only saw the theatrical. I, I saw it in theaters, yeah. The theatrical cut still worked for me, but there's like, um, so for example, there's a lot of scenes of him investigating Batman as a character. Uh, and like, so doing uh, Clark Kent reporter stuff. And, like, looking into uh, him abusing people in prison and branding them and what that means. And um, just, like, you know, how he just beats up poor people. And so it shows a bunch of scenes of Superman doing that. Yeah. And that happens before he confronts him in the Batmobile and, like, rips off the hood. Oh, oh, oh okay. And so the studio cut that because, like, we got to keep the movie going. Um and, but it's like, oh, but that's an important character beat, but we still left in all the Wonder Woman junk. So I feel like there's, yeah. you know, the pressure of, like, we have to build up to Justice League. But um, even without that in there, I, I felt like enough of that about Superman's character was implied where I'm like, this makes sense to me. Yeah. But I understand that that's a level that, like, a lot of moviegoers aren't willing to go is, like, how much are you willing to accept implication versus how much do you actually need to show? So I understand well, that that's, that that's like, a balance because I think growing up with 90s movies, maybe I got so accustomed to them being shitty that you had to just, like, make a bunch of implications <laughs> in order for them to be somewhat reasonable. Um, but then especially with the extended cut, like, it's like, oh, I think this is a very valid, reasonable take on Superman. Um, but also not everyone saw the extended cut, so I get that. Yeah. 
But, well, and I think this is all speaking to the the fundamental fatal flaw of the DC cinematic universe, which is that they 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 bit off more than they could chew too fast. Yeah. You know, they tried to build up to Avengers in two movies. You know, uh, uh, you you can't have that Avengers level team up. You know, uh, uh, after only two films. Right, and it's I mean, not going to have that same. If you're counting Man of Steel, but yeah, well, you yeah, need, three. Actually. You need a whole four films to do that. You, you at least, at least, because you would need. I, ideally, you would have had Man of Steel. There would have been a whole Batman film, uh, because really, that to me was the only scene I came out of Batman v Superman going. This is a good scene. Is that that the extended scene? scene? With yeah, the Batman warehouse scene, like that—that that was a, a good Batman. That that you, that could have just been put out as a little Batman short fan film, and that would be great. You know, you, you say you have a whole little Batman film. Uh, uh, you do your Wonder Woman movie. Uh, you do your Batman v Superman. Uh, you know, it, it's it's just the fact that Batman v Superman had to cram in Wonder Woman. Had to cram in all that stuff about the the, the computer files where he's got video of yeah that all... was that was that was terrible like like oh, God, even though yeah. I like this movie I would now in certain parts are cringe but yeah like I feel like the the philosophical musings that like everyone's like oh this is so bad I'm like look they had one of the same writers from the Dark Knight writing that stuff um, and they can't all be winners <laughs> but what I'm saying is that I feel like. <laughs> I feel like it's a lot of that stuff is stronger than a lot of people give it credit for. Uh, like it's it, you can tell there's clearly the Watchmen influence, the the oh, Dark yeah. Knight Rises influence. Like you can tell what he was going for. And for me, I felt it was it succeeded without repeating the exact beats necessarily. Yeah, uh, uh, well, it it certainly doesn't repeat a lot of beats. I'll I'll agree. I'll agree on that. Uh, I just, it, it just, to me, it was a, it was a messy film all the way through that ends in just this weird cluster fuck of, of a doomsday fight. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I look, I would acknowledge like the doomsday fight isn't good. Uh, yeah. I would acknowledge Wonder Woman needed to be cut and all the Justice League stuff, but like all the other stuff I'm fine with as an artistic choice of something that's different, especially when we have so many superhero movies. I'm like, oh, yeah. like, the hardcore objectivist angst take, I'm fine with, because we have so many other things. But also, like, you know, I find some of the criticisms to sort of fall flat. Like, man, Batman is such a jerk in this movie. Like, that's his arc, is to learn to not be a jerk. Is yeah, to exactly. let go of his yeah. cynicism. So, like, there, there are legitimate critiques that I acknowledge, but I feel like a lot of the arguments are sort of like, Simple bad faith arguments, like the argument, like Kiss can't play their instruments, so they're not a good band, is yeah, like yeah. not an actual good faith argument because Kiss can play their instruments unless their names are Ace Freely and Peter Chris. And but you know, <laughs> well, hey, hey, <laughs> when, Ace when Freely Ace is and Peter on, Chris he's uh, on. in 2020. Oh, okay, well, do you, do you, well, I don't know. Did you, you hear Origins too? Uh, yeah, I, I I did a reaction to it on the channel. Um, oh, okay. Oh, I need to see that. Uh, so, oh, or to one of the songs at least. So here's the thing. Yeah. Um, I've got friends who play with Ace. They are absolutely carrying him, one hundred percent. They are they are freaking carrying him, and it's That's blatantly yeah. obvious to anyone who sees him because like, oh yeah, these hired gun Nashville guys who are just like the cream of the crop musicians. They're playing with Ace. Uh, yeah, like they're no, no they're completely carrying him. Yeah, I, I mean, it, I'm sure he's fine in the studio, but yeah. like live, he's a wreck. Yeah, I agree. But but he's such a lovable goof of a wreck. Well, I don't know. Like the older I, I get, know. the less <laughs> forgiven I am of Ace Freely. Less. Oh, like this dude who mugged people and like wears Nazi memorabilia. Uh, just like you yeah, know what? says he like a lot of says things. homophobic things. Um, despite being in, despite being by and being in fucking kiss yeah <laughs> and, and, and uh, kissing peter chris's penis that one time uh, more than that uh according to uh peter chris's book oh you know what yeah i remember that oh i need to reread Peter's but just book. like the thing know. is like ace freely just seems like you know you don't know, like you have that friend who's just like really funny and yeah. just like you hang around with him, but you also know that person is like a really despicable character and will steal yeah. fifty bucks from you for drugs. 
but they're I funny. Agree. They tell I a agree. really good joke. So like, I'll keep you on Facebook, but I'm going to like not feel completely comfortable when I'm at a house show with you because I know you're going <laughs> to try to steal my wallet for drug money. Like, that's, that's Ace Freely. <laughs> that's fair. And just like, you know, I feel like the man is like, if he wasn't a rock star, mm-hmm. people would just think that guy is a scoundrel, piece of trash human being. But because he's a rock star, like, oh, Ace. And <laughs> the thing is, like, I, I love the persona of Ace. And I love a lot of things he's accomplished musically. I love him on stage when he's in his prime. Uh, and I feel like I would probably... <sighs> Depending on how he viewed me, get along with him. Like, hmm. if I wasn't a pro, if I was just like on some kind of equal footing with him where he wasn't just like trying to exploit me for money as a Kiss fan. Yeah. Um, like, if, if we were like in some sort of such situation where we were just like meeting as peers, we would potentially get along. But I, I could also see like my personality grading on him and his grading on me and just like us just like. <laughs> Not gelling like, hey, I'm going to make a joke with word plays. Like, what are you talking about, Curly? I'm so high. I don't understand anything. Even though he's been clean for years. Um, yeah. Uh, well, there's but, so much residual in his blood, though. I'm I, sure. I, I feel like some of those performances are just like when he says he's been clean for years. And I watch some of those performances like the bullshit you've been clean for years. Uh, I, I, I believe him. I, I think that he's done irreparable damage to himself. But I, especially I think. I think if you compare interviews with him now to like interviews with him in like, I think 90- Trump is the only good choice for the country, Curly. Well, oh yeah, I'm not saying that he's an intelligent, well-spoken. <laughs> like, I'm just saying that I don't currently think he's on drugs. <laughs> like, I completely disagree with him on 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 a lot of things that he talks about. Uh, but uh, he, his words are no longer as slurred as they were. <laughs> yeah, I. Don't, I you know, it's it's a bummer when, like, you just slowly start to like your heroes less. Um, yeah. yeah. But more and more, you know, Ace has fallen into the camp of, like, um, Gary Glitter. Were like, I don't really like you as a person, but, man, you sure were cool on stage and have some awesome tunes in your catalog. Well, Ace may be pretty despicable. I don't know if he's in Gary Glitter level yet. You know what I honestly believe? Huh. I think that more of our 70s heroes are in Gary Glitter territory than we care to admit they just haven't gotten caught. Yeah, well... Uh, like, yeah, let's, you just, know, let's keep it real. Let's keep it real. In the 70s, it, it was just like, man, we're breaking down the barriers of sexual exploration. Because, like, David Bowie is all like, man, I might, I might have sex with a dude. I might have sex with anybody. Who knows who I'll have sex with? Like, come on. I, I, yeah. I, 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 I think that just most of them didn't get caught um and you know are at least like complicit in some way like in paul's book he's talking about the bill of coin thing and how bill of oh. coin was with you know underage uh you know boys and how um you know to kiss fans like oh that's sweet lovable bill of coin he was just this guy with a big heart who got kiss off their feet do you know why he did that so he could get all the cocaine in the world and sleep with <laughs> underage boys because he got into rock and roll because he's a damn scoundrel so many of these people that we like are scoundrels abysmal yeah. human beings let's just call it like as some of them found jesus um you know, Peter Chris said he said he said his prayers every night. Uh, you know, after yeah. doing <laughs> cocaine and all kinds of terrible things, and shooting se- television, right? Shooting television, yeah. and he seems like he's a. You know, I think a lot of them are nice guys now, but like so many of these people were damn scoundrels back in the day. Oh yeah, and you know what? It's funny. I bet in the seventies, Peter would have been the one that I least wanted to hang with. But in 2020, he's the one that I think I could have the most chill time with. Oh, yeah, Just absolutely. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. I, he seems the most well-adjusted, I think, in today. I feel like Paul would be the one, would be another one you could get along with unless you, like, said that one thing that would set him off. And so he would be great for, like, 90% of the conversation. But if you said that one thing by accident, he oh, would immediately yeah. turn icy. But would be, for the most part... Like loving, chill, open-minded, receptive. But if it, if there's that one thing that challenges him, he would turn on you like that. Yeah, it it it. I mean, how how many stories have you you know how many stories have there been in the Kiss world of people who have been friends with Paul and then they say one thing and and that's the last they ever hear from him. That's kind of what impressed me about the the Rogan interview is that Rogan was able to press Paul on stuff and like Paul 
like wasn't able to just like shut him up because Rogan is Rogan. <laughs> I haven't. Uh, I need to see that. I haven't seen that one yet. Gotta see it before it's only on Spotify, man. Or if you have Spotify, whatever. Um, but it's on the oh, YouTube. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, th- that that w- it's really great because like he's really pressuring Paul about saying like, look, like if a kid is completely broke. Why is it that big of a deal if he pirates an album from, like, 1974? If a kid is broke, loves your music, you know, is a big fan, wants to buy it, and just can't, you know, what's the issue with, like, that kid who just wants to listen to your music because they sincerely love it? Yeah. And so, like, Paul, like, kept dodging it, and then eventually, like, was able to, like, concede a point and then discuss it with Rogan. But the fact that, like, Joe Rogan has the power to get even Paul Stanley to, like, reasonably debate... (laughs) <laughs> I think that speaks to the power of Rogan. Like that's that that's impressive, and yeah. like Paul Stanley doesn't bat down from anybody, but Rogan's yeah. like, look at all my muscles, man. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, there there's a fist fight I'd like to see, though. I I I I would love to see a UFC match between Joe Rogan and Paul Stanley. I think uh, Joe Rogan versus Henry Rollins would be a much more entertaining fight. Oh, that would be that would be a, a testosterone explosion. <laughs> what you'd have to do though to make it uh, peak, because uh, Rollins has been on the show, I think, a couple times. You have to have them like roll on the jujitsu mat. Whoever taps, you know, taps, and then they like get into a debate. They debate for ten minutes, then get back on the mat. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Tell me that would not be the most amazing thing ever. I'd I'd watch that. I would certainly watch that. Oh, I'd watch the hell out of that. <laughs> yeah, that that's wild. sort of the ultimate of like bro philosophy, but guys who could also do well in a fight. Yeah. Like, yeah, that'd be amazing. Yeah. My one of my favorite like rock interviews. Uh, do you ever do you know about Nardwar? I do not. He's he was a he well, still is he's a Canadian uh, uh, music journalist. Uh, it goes by Nardwar the Human Serviette, which is like a serviette is like a napkin in, in uh, French French Canada. Um, but he just he does these interviews where he knows freakish amounts of things about the artists that he's interviewing, like things that that they are surprised that he knows. So they're kind of constantly off guard and confused as to why he knows certain things, and he's also giving them gifts sometimes that are extremely important albums to these people that like they didn't know that anyone knew that they liked and he never talks about how he gets his sources but in the 90s he did an interview with with henry rollins and uh uh, henry rollins looks like he is about to beat nardwar to death (laughs) because nardwar i think one of the questions is uh because he he was just fucking around with with henry rollins because he would like ask him like some intelligent question about you know the history of, of black flag and touring and da, 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 da. and then he would say uh would you consider eating more power bars to get more rips so that you have more space for tattoos <laughs> and just stuff like that and and you know uh yeah he also got alice cooper to hang up on him one time uh and he, and he put up the tape where it's him talking to alice's uh handler and uh, the handler's like, all right, yes, yeah, so you'll have, you know, 20 minutes with Alice. And da, da, da. OK, and the next voice you're going to hear is Alice Cooper's. And then you hear Alice go, hello. And Nardwar goes, hey, stupid, it's Nardwar. And Alice <laughs> goes, huh? And he's obviously making a reference to the to the album. Hey, stupid. But it, he just couldn't get past that point. Alice, Alice hung up on him. Oh, man. You'd think that Alice would have gotten that. Um... You, you think? Yeah, yeah. But also, I mean, Alice also does seem kind of like a... For a guy who does so much trolling, he does seem like a no-bullshit kind of guy. Yeah, uh, yeah, I agree, yeah. I mean, maybe maybe that's more the case, like, nowadays. You know, maybe if it was, like, 75, you know, and Nardwar tried that with 1975, drunken mm-hmm. Alice. Yeah, he might have been drunk enough to just be, let it slide. Um, <laughs> let it slide. Let it slide. Yeah, uh, yeah, it does sound like um, some amazing troll, and I know that he never oh, got Nardwar. near the Kiss guys. There's no yeah, way. <laughs> Nardwar never talked to anyone from Kiss. Uh, he's got some great interviews with like like uh, Daniel Johnston. I don't know if you're a Daniel Johnston fan. Not. Uh, 
but do, uh, do you know, have you, have you heard about him? Or? No, no. Oh, he's great. He, I want to say he was a Nashville. No, I'm no, I don't think he lived in Nashville. I forget, but, uh, he was a singer songwriter who, uh, uh, he had schizophrenia, um, uh, uh, unfortunately, which, which, you know, uh, created a lot of problems for him, but he, he would just record these great albums in his, uh, like basement, you know, throughout the early eighties, kind of when home recording was still kind of a, a fringy, you know, like thing that not everyone had access to. Uh, and he would just sell, sell these cassettes and, you know, he kind of, the stuff that he would write, uh, is, is pretty, pretty amazing. And then some of it's very, uh, very touching and very kind of heart wrenching. And, and, uh, he unfortunately passed away, uh, last year, but, uh, yeah, no, Daniel Johnston, uh, incredible, uh, incredible songwriter. Man, uh, the fact that home recording was um, niche at one point and now has become so mainstream has shifted things so much. I think that... Oh, yeah. Do you feel like the increased access to music has... Like, the increased access to making music has diminished the uh, maybe prestige of being a musician? Um, Cause, well, yeah. Because, you know, there's there's certain... Because, you know, I'm. You, I assume you're also friends with a bunch of older musicians, given your tastes. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so you you meet these guys who had like records pressed in the day. They had to go into a studio to make them. Um, of it's the kind of thing where you can't like you know correct all of it in Pro Tools. Like you have to nail the take, and it's a real yeah. pain in the butt to rewind the tape and get it right and all that stuff. And you know, as someone, you know, you recorded in a proper studio. I, I assume you've been in a proper studio for at least some of the albums, if not all of them. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I've recorded, you know, the first album in a proper studio. The second album was in a home studio. But I still got that, you know, studio experience. Like, you're on the clock. You got to get it right because you're running out of the time. You got to, you know, keep moving. You got to nail it. And yeah. uh, the sort of... Um, increased pressure with like putting out a quality product where you know the time you're spending mixing mastering you know really engineering something versus you can get something that you know someone does like a guitar cover on youtube they have their presets the way they are and they're just playing over a backing track with their you know drop tuned metal tune like oh man check it out i did a metal version of duck tales and they'll get a million views and the sound quality will be Truthfully, truthfully, you know, comparable to a lot of the stuff that we're doing and laboring over. Um, yeah. And so I wonder, like, you know, has that, like, ruined, like, the mystique of someone who, you know, uh, like an Alice Cooper album, just like, you know, the magic of, like, a, a full album experience, the musicians playing together, and just does it really mean the same thing to be a musician anymore? Well, I, I mean, I think the people who want to put out those kinds of immersive experiences are still able to. And if anything, I think now more people, you know, uh, because I mean, there are lots of bands that I love who, if it wasn't for uh, uh, re recording being so prevalent and accessible that they wouldn't get their, get their stuff out there. There's a, there was an album I found at this point over a decade ago called Chill Bill is Leaving. And I just found it randomly on Bandcamp and it was by this guy William Chill, and since he's he's taken that album down and he he switched his name, I don't know what he performs under now, but that was just a random album that I found that he wrote in his apartment, and it's one of my favorite albums of all time. You know what I mean? And like if he had to go the more traditional route of of getting into a studio, finding someone to distribute it, da da da, da you know, I wouldn't have that album that is very dear to me you know so i mean yeah i think it has kind of taken away some of the the prestige and and i and i guess yeah a good amount of the 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 mystique since now it's you know most laptops come with you know max anyway come with garage band on it mm -hmm. you know you can you know slap together a couple of loops and and you know say whatever you want and you know have a song uh but uh i i think that you know more People having access to creative tools like this is 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 only a good thing. You know, I mean, sure, I don't think we're going to have another 
like Led Zeppelin or another Jimi Hendrix. Uh, instead, I think we will have uh, kind of a hundred more microscopic versions of that kind of thing. And, and the people who, you know, uh, uh, the people who are into that music will eventually find it. But, you know, isn't this maybe a, a good case of uh, why socialism is bad? Because if you give everyone uh, access to everything, no one rises to the top. Everyone just sort of, like, <laughs> remains microscopic. Well, I mean, it's it's not like there still aren't new uh, uh, stadium artists emerging. Not that anyone's playing in stadiums right now. But, like, I mean, you know. Uh, uh, but, well, what? Just, Justin Bieber, right? Started out recording stuff in his house, right? Just a little singing gospel shit and putting it on YouTube. And then, you know, look at him. He, he became as, as, as corporate as, as, uh, as anyone ever was. I mean, that, that's fair, but I, you know, there's a part of me that feels that, you know, I have, I have sucks mixed feelings on it because I do like the idea of like anyone who wants to create music can, and, mm-hmm. you know, get it out there and get it to the people. But I feel like because the barrier for entry has been lowered, there's just so much more garbage that gets out there because of that, uh, which, you know, some people would accuse that my stuff is that garbage that shouldn't have been allowed to get out there because of that. <laughs> so, you know, I, but I feel like the, there was something about like the increased difficulty and like the fact that you had to work so hard to get your stuff out there back in the day that I think made you hone your craft more. Um, and so there, maybe that's the part I, I miss is that there there doesn't seem to be – there seems to be a lot more people who aren't honing the craft who are just shoving the stuff out there. And I think that is diminishing the quality and value of music as a whole, especially as you're looking at like, you know, streaming deals where, you know, artists are basically getting nothing for Spotify pays. It's essentially like, you know, music I think is of the, you know, the, the arts, I think one of the most um, – devalued in our current market and current society because you know if spotify is too expensive for you youtube with ad blocker if you're uh if you're an artist that you know is is a, a relevant credible artist and your stuff is on all the streaming services it'll auto upload to youtube uh at least like you know the version with like here's the thumbnail and just like oh, the, yeah. so you know your stuff is on youtube that way my stuff is on youtube that way um 100%, yeah so, like, there are ways that people are going to be able to listen to your stuff basically for free, or you'll get that, like, you know, fraction of a penny for the play. Um, so I I feel like the the music itself has been so devoured, and it's, you know, a commercial for the T-shirt. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, it's a commercial, and I feel like as a, as a musician, uh-huh. uh, it's gotten to the point where I, I, I've realistically don't see much value in doing music anymore. Like what Paul Stanley says, like, why should I put mu- put out music if no one cares about it and no one's going to pay for it? I'm like, you know what, Paul Stanley, you make a pretty good point. Uh, as much as you, uh, like, you just have to love it and love it for the sake of that. Um, and I don't know um, if it's worth that time investment and money investment. Cause like, it's just, it's such a money pit and sink. I mean, it, it, it... It can't. I mean, my my response to kind of the, the streaming thing has always been, you know, like it's I, great as a consumer. It is awesome. Oh as yeah, a it's lovely as a consumer. And really, even for me as as someone in in a band, I mean, I can't tell you how many times it's happened where people come up to me at shows and and say like, "Oh yeah, I just found you guys on Spotify uh, the other day, and I've been listening to you since then." Uh, you know, or even some people even saying, oh, you know, I, I, uh, uh, a friend of mine burned me a copy of the album or, uh, uh, or I downloaded the, you know, downloaded the album from somewhere. Uh, you know, saying that to me while in, in one hand they have a, a, a vinyl copy of an album. In another hand, they have a t-shirt and there's a ticket in their pocket, you know, and, and like, I'm, I'm not, I'm not saying that to make it seem like I'm, you know, I'm. I'm no, certainly no Gene Simmons uh, in terms of how much money I have or the ego I have about that money that also, I have. Yeah, also, I, I think Kiss of all bands should, like, them complain about their fans not buying enough shit from them is such bullshit. That is, yeah. What's that? They're, they're trying to sell me a, 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 a Kiss Alive edition Viewmaster now? <laughs> like, 
That being said, though, on their, I did see an ad on their official store for a Kiss Meets the Phantom of the Park t-shirt that I think I'm going to buy. Ah, so, damn it. Like, they I'm, got me. You know, I, I feel like, um, man, I'm a shill in so many ways. We're just like, I'm so sick of Kiss crap, but if you shove something frozen in front of me, I will eat that up immediately. Oh, yeah. It's just whatever flavor people like, you know. I mean, I'm, yeah, I, I, I you know, I, I, I've always been pro collections, you know, since since I was a kid. Um, I, you know, like I'd certainly, if I had the money and space, I'd have a much bigger Kiss or Star Trek or or Star Wars or you know collection, vinyl collection probably. You know, I wonder if but, I had the sp- if I had the money in space, I probably would not be actively buying frozen merchandise. I'd buy all the I'd, really? I'd buy all the books. Um, I finally read all the frozen comics. I just got to read those two novels, but I'm broke, so I can't afford them right now. But those two books, they're on the huh. list. I, I didn't realize that Frozen had such an extended uh, extended universe going on. Uh, honestly, most of it isn't that great. Uh, oh, okay. the, yeah. the extended universe stuff, like the comics, uh, actually the Dark Horse comics are good. Uh, they're just like, hey, we're going to have like real character development and arcs. <laughs> is it a much grittier, more like, uh, is it, is it right? Because that was, a, isn't that how Dark Horse started? They were like DC's initial excuse to do grittier uh, heavier things. I, I don't know. Uh, I, I want to say I thought that they were that... independent, but I don't, I, I don't know. Uh, oh no, you know what? I'm thinking of, uh, there's another one I'm thinking of. Cause Dark I, I Horse, forget. isn't anyway. that, uh, Spawn? Um, isn't that Dark Horse? Oh yeah, it is. You're right. So You're from right. Spawn to Frozen, uh, Dark Horse yeah. comics. Um, Where's that crossover comic? Oh man. Um, when, uh, Elsa goes to hell and just freezes everything. Yeah. Like when hell freezes over. <laughs> and then the clown has to send Spawn after Olaf. Elsa, I- Olaf in hell. <laughs> the clown <laughs> just gets annoyed by Olaf. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh-huh. But yeah, the Frozen comics, uh, you know what? Um, some of them were good, but a lot of them were just um, very clearly just like, this is made for kids and I'm not the audience for it. Like, you know how yeah. with a lot of Disney stuff, it's like, this is good for kids, but also can make a grown man cry. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Most of the Frozen comics were just like, okay, this is just for kids. Why are you reading this as a grown man? That's fair. That's but, fair. But yeah, I there feel were like... a couple that were good. Yeah. It makes sense. It makes sense. You, you know, know they, they they figured who their who their target market was for that. <laughs> I, still, I still have not seen any of the Frozen movies. Um, I uh, highly recommend uh, – do you have Disney Plus? I do. Um, the Frozen docu-series on that is uh, very good and one of the top two docu-series I've seen. It's like Last Dance good. Okay. Um, where they just go behind the scenes of the making of the movie, and um, they pretty much show all of it. There's only one scene where they tell the cameras to not be in the room, uh, which makes you want to be in the room that much Ooh, more. Even more, yeah. Which is um, after they do the audience test screening, uh, and everyone just looks stressed as hell. Oh, and, I bet. And they're yeah. just like, no cameras in the room today. And then they show like the actors like, we're changing a lot of this film. <laughs> and just like <laughs> the, the look on their face where you just like, you know that meeting was just so damn brutal. But like, the th- that docuseries is really, really great. It's like a six-episode docu series on Disney Plus. Oh, um, nice, yeah. So I, 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 I highly recommend that. Like it's not um they did like a mini documentary for the first film, uh-huh. which really uh isn't that great. Mm-hmm. Um and it's like made for like, okay, this is like consumed by children. Like you can watch that as like an adult and just be interested in like the craft of filmmaking and yeah. what goes into story decisions. And also they have a lot of stuff with the songwriters and, like, how the songs evolve throughout the process of the film and how they have to change it with the script and working with the uh, the singers. And how, I, I, I'd recommend it. But also, I, you know, I'm pushing Frozen on a lot of people, so I recommend that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, it's, it, I, I have definitely wanted to see it. I mean, I'm a big, you know, I'm, 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 I'm a pro-Disney uh, person. You have Disney Plus. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, shoot, and I, a, you know, I like Frozen all the short coming out in October. You could marathon. Ooh. They have, they have, you know how they have the collections on Disney Plus? There's an yeah. entire Frozen collection section. 
Okay, yeah, I can just make it through that. I'll, I'll get through that before the new Mandalorian season comes out. Oh, there you go. That's your that's your next yeah. binge. I was, you know what? I feel like I'm the only person who has Disney Plus who hasn't watched any of the Mandalorian. Oh, it leave all preconceptions of like the Star Wars movies and and what a series like yeah no Mandalorian is is I think some of the best Star Wars that has ever been I mean but also remember this is a guy who doesn't like Star Wars like then you might really like the Mandalorian the, I, I've seen <laughs> nine Star Wars films I thought one of them was good so they yeah. have a one in nine average with me and the one you liked was uh was it Last Jedi yes yeah well hey that Last Jedi is a great movie so I, I agree with you yeah, I, I know that that infuriates so many people when I say, yeah, they did they did one good movie, The Last Jedi. Yeah, I mean, I... Especially, I, I, like, if all I the didn't... alt-right Star Wars fans. Oh, Jesus, yeah. <laughs> and, like, if I didn't know you, I would be uh, offended that you only liked one. Uh, but, uh, uh... Now that yeah. you know me, you're just like, oh. Now that I know you, this is Greg. This is This <laughs> makes sense. This tracks. But hey, uh, at, at least the at least the one that you're defending isn't two or nine. Yeah, I feel like uh, there there there's there's a buddy. I know he's not going to listen to this, um, uh-huh. so I hope he just like doesn't figure out his name. I'm not going to say him by name, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it is a uh, it is another podcasting friend of mine who. Um, I think he released like two podcasts defending episode nine. And I just didn't have the heart to listen to them. I'm like, yeah. bro, that is that is the Kool Aid. Like, well, a that, lot of people's defense of of nine. He said it was a, the, the, he said it was a fantastic end to the. Oh shoot, I'm so giving him away. <laughs> uh, how but, how can anyone think that it's a fa- it, it's not an ending? It is. I mean, there's a part of me that was impressed with how much J.J. Abrams was able to J.J. Abrams that movie. <laughs> like, yeah. that was some impressive J.J. abrams of that film. Um, yeah. But, yeah, but there were just so many. I mean, the most common defense that I hear of Episode Nine was people say, well, it's the best J.J. could have done with the way Ryan Johnson left things. It really wasn't. It's the it's worst. Not at it's all. the worst he could have done. It's like you could have like, hey, I'm gonna take this ball and run with it. It's like, you know what? Instead, uh, we're gonna play hockey instead. We're not gonna play yeah. with this ball. We're we're playing hockey now. And yeah, it wasn't even the Mighty pre- Ducks. We're gonna pretend that that home run that you hit. Uh, all of a sudden was actually a, a, a Hail Mary touchdown pass that you threw, and the rest of the game shall be played as football. You know, it, I, th- yeah, I feel it, like uh, Last Jedi proved to me that Star Wars fans uh, don't deserve good movies. <laughs> because, like, hey, like, right. we're actually going to give you something challenging that expands the lore, that sets up things to move in interesting directions. Um, yeah allows additional nuance for characters, allows for it to not just to be a retread of the past, and then Shows just... that Luke changed in the 30 years that you hadn't seen him. Right. <laughs> As opposed to just still being the kind of the gallivanting, you know, uh, eager space farm boy, you know. Like, he... and also that The Last Jedi did things that made logical sense. Like, what? You're telling me that Luke is a grumpy curmudgeon? Yeah. How could he be a grumpy curmudgeon when he's been in exile for thirty years? Yeah, you know, uh, you know the 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 guy whose uh, whose dad cut his hand off, and then a couple years later he wound up uh, uh, killing and then having to burn while on a planet of sentient teddy bears. Uh, yeah, it turns out that guy had some problems later in life. Like, yeah, fucking a. <laughs> you know how him having to come to terms with the fact that. that he, that his father is directly responsible uh, in a lot of ways for a lot of horrible things that happened in in the uh, galaxy. You know? and, and look, that's not to say that like there aren't problems with Last Jedi. Like it is oh, still, no, it's not a perfect. It movie. is still a Star Wars movie, so it can't of be course. completely good. You know, that's well, the rules. <laughs> okay, <laughs> it's not perfect. I'll say that. <laughs> but you know, even with the flaws, like the fact that like they just set up like, hey, here's the military industrial complex. How do we end the cycle of war? The fact that they just like whiz past that in uh, yeah. Rise of Skywalker, never even like address that as being like, hey, are we actually gonna like stop the cycle somehow? 
Because that would actually be an interesting conclusion. Like, how do we break the cycle of violence? That would be interesting. Yeah. And they're just like, no, just like be stronger than Palpatine again. Y- yeah. Yeah. It, well, there's, uh, uh, are you a fan of Jenny Nicholson on YouTube? Uh, I've, I've seen some of her videos. I wouldn't call myself a fan, but I, yeah. let me put it this way. I watched a number of her videos, but I didn't hit sub. Oh, okay. Well, her, her episode nine video. Was, was uh, the, the thumbnail, I'll never be happy again. Yes. <laughs> Which is a very it's a it's a sarcastic thumbnail. I yes, uh, I I, yeah. I think I did see it, but also, yeah. it it doesn't stick out to me. Um, so, oh, yeah. she had a lot of a lot of great points about just kind of the the. I mean, there's a lot that's bad about the movie, so she probably just said stuff I agree with. Like this was also bad. Like yes, you're correct, uh, yeah. person. Yeah, very much. Yeah, yeah. Like I didn't remember there being a new insight, but also I think it's because like. That movie is so rife with bad material that it's it's hard to like find something that someone didn't already address as being bad about that film. Well, there were just a number of things that I didn't even put together, like how how depressing is it that our last shot of Ray is her alone in a desert, l- looking kind of sad. That's how we met her. Alone in a desert, looking kind of sad. But isn't that what we all want from Star Wars movie? For things to never actually evolve, <laughs> things to go back to status quo. The, uh, Star that, Wars is just a sitcom that isn't funny. I, I found out that is what a large swath of Star Wars fans apparently want. I I wanted the bright promise of the J, of the uh, Ryan Johnson uh, Star Wars universe. And you know what? That's why Rocky is better than Star Wars because there's actual growth, development, and consequences in those films. I, I, well, I still have never seen a, a complete Rocky movie. Do you mind spoilers for the, for the Rocky franchise? I mean, I, I know some, I'm, I'm, I, I do want to see these films, so I don't necessarily want a bunch more spoilers. Well, here, here's what I'll say. Like there's, you're never allowed to go back. Yeah. Is what I would say. So, like, you know how in Star Wars, just things sort of like get reset to the, oh, here's um, you know, the Empire's back. Uh, but you know, then we'll like when bad stuff happens in Rocky, like, yeah, that actually has consequences for the future. And mm. like, it's much closer to real life, where like when you face a setback and you find yourself in a bad situation, how you get out of said bad situation. And so. Like, the, the story doesn't really retread the same ground, if that makes sense. Yeah, like yeah. Like, there's, there's parallels, but there's, there's like, a surprise... There's a consequence. Actions have consequences, I would say, in the Rocky yeah. films. And so, like, you know, many films are just, like, the fallout of what happened in the previous film, where a, a lot of them begin with, like the last scene of the previous film is the first scene of that film. And then what happens directly after that? They do that for the first five movies. We're just like the very first scene is like the last scene of the previous movie. Oh, wow. Yeah. And just like, all right, here's what happened right after that. Yeah. Like strip, like here's the ambulance. You know? so it's like Halloween one and two, the original uh, first two Halloween films. Right. Uh, but like it, it just kept going that way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, you mean Rocky Three isn't a completely unrelated? Uh, I guess that joke only works if you've seen Halloween Three. Uh, no, I, I the, and the things I've only seen bits and pieces of those films, so I, I, I won't judge them as horror yeah. that I don't like. But um, like, I'm, oh, see, I'm a, I'm a very character focused guy, and I yeah. get so bored um, from the victimization of horror because it's just like. All right, we're all powerless to stop this thing. That really sucks. Do 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 do. Like I'm just like, <laughs> I can only see the like I'm powerless trope, and then everything yeah. sucks, and then hopefully I might survive this ordeal thing. Like I'm so just, I'm sick of that. Um, I think mainly also like living in like America, like I I really don't like that trope uh, as as it's maybe too close to reality. <laughs> That's fair. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of great horror films. I mean, to me, that... I mean, you just described kind of excellent slasher... Like, like points about slasher films, which, of course, Halloween is a, a slasher film. But there, there's... Even with, like, um, non-slasher films, 
Um, I'm trying to think of like an example of something that's not quite a slasher. Um, like it, it, it just it too often it feels like there's there's not enough fighting back in those films. Mm. Um, like I, I read the plot synopsis for Hereditary, um, and it just seems like okay, like I'm I'm powerless against this force, and and everything I do is ultimately futile. Oh, um, see, I haven't actually seen Hereditary. Uh, okay, well, but, yeah. but uh, or even like uh, Midsummer, just like there's nothing we can do about this. Well, uh, to, to claim that that's the point of Midsummer is, but it's it it's so often it's it's such a core to the identity of horror is is powerlessness and uh, just being along for the ride. Um, mm-hmm. And like I'm a guy who like got in street fights as a kid and like. You, you know, my whole, like, child abuse arc of just, like, you know, my getting out of the situation and, you know, taking my destiny into my own hands uh, yeah. despite, you know, being much weaker. And so I don't I don't resonate with that kind of thing, and it just, like, makes okay. me angry. Yeah. Like, I just get angry at weakness, and I'm just, like, you know, every time I just – I'm watching those movies, like, man, like, Rambo would fucking kill this dude. Like, Predator is great. Oh, Predator is an amazing film. But that's because <laughs> Predator – like – as as I think I talked about this uh, maybe with Steve, I don't know if you were in the conversation, but it was just like every great horror film is really just an action film. I wouldn't say every, <laughs> but there there are lots like like aliens. I, I think isn't that is, one? Isn't that just basically just an action film? Well, which is like, yeah, Aliens is just an action action film with jump scares, some jump scares, some aliens pop out at you. Ooh. Right, but I mean. Whatever, it's an action film. <laughs> yeah, Aliens is the the first Alien though, is is a horror film. Yeah, uh, and uh, look, there's, I feel like there's a lot of limited storytelling capacity with that kind of stuff, um, hmm. and so it's mainly about like how cool of are your set pieces, and with horror films, the set pieces usually just like how cool is this death of this protagonist character. Um, mm. or like, you know, secondary protagonist, like, you know, yeah. the supporting character, how cool is this character's death is most of the cool set pieces in horror. And I, I don't know. It's just, it's not as awesome as like, you know, Rambo running away from explosions. I mean, I, I, there, there are, I mean, I, I, I agree with you when it comes to films like, uh, uh, of course, now I can't think of a single single uh, guy. Like Final Destination. That is okay, the entire per- perfect movie. example. Exactly. That yeah. That that is a collection of like, you know, interesting in quotes death scenes. But if if you look at a film like Hellraiser, right? Did you ever see the original Hellraiser? I've not seen the original Hellraiser. I did see the original Nightmare on Elm Street. That I would say was a good film. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. But I, I don't know. I'm just uh, I'm. I'm so like the powerlessness thing. Like it's a it's a hard thing for me to get past with those films. Could, well, the the try the try Hellraiser one because that that movie to me is very interesting in in that the monsters in it are are neither good nor evil. And and all the motivation all, all, all the uh, uh, the there are people in it who are trying to do bad things but the the it's it's a very it's a very interesting setup for a film the guy who wrote it clive barker uh just wrote spoiler it for me i i don't care about spoilers like oh. the thing is spoilers are what sells me on a film like if i really yes so like if yeah. a film if you if the spoilers actually sound like oh that's interesting i'll check it out if the spoilers like oh that doesn't actually seem like it's that good i i won't even bother yeah. with it so like I look up spoilers for movies before I go see them. Very seldom do I just uh, go into a movie uh, blind. Um, uh, like I want to know if it's worth my time because like look I'm a busy guy I got a lot of stuff to do and so like if it's just like oh no like the virgin white girl lives like all right skip I'm all right yeah no there I like mean, like Brightburn was a movie that looked kind of interesting to me and, oh yeah and then I, I read the spoilers that. I'm like yeah all right that's what you did with it I'm good. Well, that I mean, Brightburn was just kind of a dark inverse of the Superman story, right? Like, like, what if Superman was evil? Like, yeah, he just kills some people 
in farm country. That's it. Yeah, but but I feel like there's so many films that that if you just break down like what happens, right? Like uh, like uh, even like like Citizen Kane, you know. But the thing uh, is, there's there's a character journey there. And with, yeah, with so many yeah, of these horror sure. films, there's not really a character journey. It's just like, I'm scared of this thing. I hope it doesn't kill me. <laughs> that's the char- Tell me that's not the character journey for almost every single horror film. Uh, of a certain genre, yes. But I, I, think, think... Of, I think of most. I think even of like non-slashers. That is the, oh, I hope this thing doesn't kill me. I mean, well, okay, yes, yes. Of, of Avoidance of death is a common, you know... I hope this uh, thing doesn't kill me and I'm scared. Yeah, yeah, that comes up a lot. I mean, yeah, because really it... it like, yeah, the, the, you, you the, the need goal, a certain amount of that for it to be is, horrific. It's is, is just always to survive whatever horrific thing is coming. And it's, and it's never usually... It's not like a proactive goal. Like... You know, so I don't think that uh, Rambo is necessarily... Rambo 2 is necessarily a good film. But there's still a proactive goal. It's like I want, I need to try to see if there are POWs in this area, and then yeah. report back to base. That is a proactive goal for the character. And then you know the goal shifts as like the tides and things you know shift. Like oh now I have to be mo co- covert and hide. And now my goal is to rescue them instead of just reporting back to base. Like, but the horror movie it always just seems to be I, there's some kind of force, be it you know, a serial killer or some mm-hmm. kind of monster or, you know, some kind of evil cult or whatever, and they are trying to kill me for some nefarious purpose, and I just need to mm-hmm. run away from it and not get killed by it. Yes. Okay, yeah. I mean, uh, that, yeah. There, 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 that, that is and a I, large and, 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 I, and I know that it's not all horror, of course. But you could say yeah. it is the vast majority of it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I, I think, I mean, horror more than really almost any other genre, I think, get, is is victim to there being a whole lot of of oftentimes delightfully terrible uh, uh, films. And films that are just so bad that you don't want to watch. You know, uh, but I mean, you know, specifically, I mean, going back to films like 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 Hellraiser. Like I think the original Night of the Living Dead. Um, Isn't that just avoiding getting killed by zombies? Oh, but then that that. Well, no, 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 no. That's that that is a large part of it. That is the reason why all of these people find themselves in that house. But then it just becomes this wonderful uh, claustrophobic pressure cooker inside the house. Of so of it's all twelve of these angry men, but with zombies. Well. There aren't twelve of them, <laughs> and uh, some of them are women, and uh, and also it's not good. Well, it's, it's just <laughs> I'm sorry. The twelve angry men. I, I don't not, know. I haven't seen it. I just haven't. Oh, been. it's it's brilliant. It's it's a brilliant film. Uh, it's 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 the kind of thing where I think nowadays, and I think the same kind of goes for the original Halloween, where their impact. You you kind of have to set aside the fact that so many movies have ripped this off now that Mm -hmm. like the trope of you know all of them being stuck in a house uh is is old or like in halloween the fact that you think the killer is dead but he gets up one last time like that you know was a new thing in halloween and wasn't done in every dumb slasher film you know ad nauseum after I, Uh, i get that but it's like you know Maybe uh, putting it back to Kiss. Like, maybe, you yeah. know, sexual lyrics, uh, like, they influenced the dumb 80s hairband sexual lyrics, uh, but that doesn't mean that Kiss's lyrics weren't dumb and bad also. Well, like, the, the core concept yeah. can still be terrible. So even if it's just like, this was, these were the first people to do this shitty thing, it can still be a well, shitty yeah. thing conceptually. But that still works, too, These if were you the look first like, Nazis. Like, like they the Beatles were the... It. <laughs> Like like the Beatles were the first to put you know reverse symbols on on an album, and now every you know lots of shitty shittier bands have have done that. You know, yeah, it, but, it there's is possible, there, but there's yeah. also something to be said about like the way that thing is done. Um, yeah, oh yeah, so, and, and in in these films, I think it was done wonderfully. It's it's now you can see it coming from kind of a mile away. 
because you've seen so many bad movies do it that when you see it done very well the first time it was done you know i I think to modern audiences it can come a little like you know i I think that's possible like you know i consume like a lot of older media of Um, course yeah like dude i just re i just read journey to the west a 500 year old novel so i understand like you know, where, like that that's such a great example where like a lot of tropes originated in that. Um yeah. but it doesn't necessarily hold up to a modern viewer sir, or modern reader, sorry. Um so like I wouldn't recommend Journey to the West for most people cuz like hey, do you want to read like more than 2000 pages of a monster of the week story that just drags on way too long with lots of Deus Ex Machina's <laughs> to solve the problems? <laughs> in general, I wouldn't recommend that to people. I recognize yeah. its historical value, but I also recommend that, you know, recognize, like, what it's not uh, doing well. Like, Deus Ex Machinas are just not good storytelling solutions. And so even though it was influential in other ways, like, that's just bad. Um, and so uh, maybe I can recognize, like, Halloween is influential in some ways, but, like, certain tropes are still just, like, kind of bad. Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, at, I, least, at least for my taste. I mean, sure. obviously, yes, all art is objective, yada, yada, yada. And, uh, you know, I people complain at me in the comments sometimes, like, you're taking this too literally. I'm like, <laughs> look, like, we all have our different preferences. And for me, sure. I find sure. um, the kinds of stories that I enjoy, um, you know, there, there's a lot of variance, but I typically like character-focused stories. Mm-hmm. Um, and something that I, uh, I find adds value to my life in some way. So like the frozen films get me to think about my life in a certain way and have a strong emotional impact. Mm-hmm. And then there's some stuff that's just like, just fun and entertaining. So like, um, Cobra is actually sort of, um, actually a good example of this where it's just it's a dumb fun entertaining movie and i'm enjoying a lot and that one's interesting because it's basically what if an action hero fought a horror slasher villain where the villain is literally called the night slasher and just like oh, wow. this serial killer dude who just goes around stabbing people with the coolest knife ever and then well, he goes up against dope. alone yeah and I'm uh that. Oh, that movie is freaking great there's that sounds fun <laughs> there's uh jean beauvoir is on the soundtrack what? That's actually his biggest hit is from that soundtrack. So oh, wow. there's John Beauvoir, there's uh, robots, um, there's Stallone wearing sunglasses in a very dark place where it makes no sense, but it's just awesome. The yeah. the car has the license plate Awesome 50. Um, nice. Yeah, so John Beauvoir, robots, Stallone fighting a slasher villain in the 80s. So this is like in his prime. So this is the prime of slashers, the prime of action movies combined. It's a masterpiece. I recommend that one to you, sir. Yeah, no, I, I really want to see this movie now. Yeah, like, I, it's, it's one of those films that I've been hearing about for a long time. And I just John Beauvoir in the soundtrack. It. Like that's the thing is non kiss fans know him from that movie. Like, oh, yeah, the guy from the guy whose song was in the Cobra soundtrack. Yeah. So is he, yeah, there you I go. just primarily know him as is you know surrogate Gene Simmons in the eighties. Better Gene Simmons in the eighties. Yeah, uh, I <laughs> I so wish he just replaced Gene for a couple albums. Those just would have been better. Yeah, Gene could have gone off and starred in Runaway and uh, uh, Never Too Young to Die. You know, and John Bouvard could have handled. Uh, well, I don't know, but then we wouldn't have uh, Secretly Cruel. We wouldn't have... Uh... I kept comparing it to the stuff that John was doing at the same time, no, it would have been much better. Uh, I agree, and, so, right. and also, well, with Kiss production, I think his stuff would have sounded better. Because um, mm. it's just, he's a, a hair poppier and not mm-hmm. as heavy. And so if you just gritted it up just a little bit, I think it would give it that extra sauce to just be really, really just, like, amazing. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and the thing is, that dude's a freaking monster. Like, I have one of his albums where he just plays all the instruments. Like, all instruments, all vocals, him. And it's great. And just, like, it's called Chameleon, and he basically switches genres each song. It's like, okay, now I'm going to do, like, a boy band song. Now I'm doing funk. Now I'm doing rock. You know, like... Sounds cool. No, the dude is the dude is freaking great and so underage. Just like, yeah, check out all these harmonies I'm doing and playing everything myself. (laughs) It's like, man, dudes like that 
make me feel like shit sometimes. Mm. Like those those one man bands who are just like, because you know you find so many people who are just like I can play a couple instruments and I can sing, but when they can do like the drums and sing really well and all the yeah. instruments, because like I you know based upon what I know about you. You play drums, you can play guitar, you can play mm-hmm. bass. I don't know how are you as a singer. Uh, I mean, I'm 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 not good, but I do it sometimes. So I'm at, but you've heard John Bouvard sing, right? I believe I have. I'm I can't remember his voice off the top of my head, but I'm sure I have. Uh, I would say he's kind of kind of similar to Michael Jackson, but a little bit more baritone and uh, okay. but still good breath support. So not yeah. quite as high of a register, but you know like R and B rock kind of thing. Yeah. And so imagine you were as good as you are at all your instruments plus that. Oh, that would be amazing. And you've heard how good he is at bass. <laughs> like his bass lines are oh, actually yeah, really he's good. So he's great yeah. at guitar, great at bass, like you know, he can solo like a motherfucker, you know, and like yeah. and then add just like killer singer on top of that and great songwriter. And you're just like, man, fuck you, save some town for the rest of us, man. The quintuple threat. Yeah, like, man, do, do, yeah. dudes like that are such freaking monsters. Oh, God, yeah. Well, it's like, you know, I mean, obviously Prince is the Right, like way. Prince, yeah. I would say um, yeah. John Bovar is the artist I would say is most similar to Prince out of any artist that I know. Um, mm. But and he's just like, what if Prince just, like, didn't make you feel as weird about sexuality, but then, like, every now <laughs> and then snuck in, like, a weird sexual thing that made you feel uncomfortable. So he's like... There you go. But also, he was in the Plasmatics, dude. Like that dude is versatile. He's like, all right, I'm gonna work with the Plasmatics, the Ramones, and Lionel Richie, and Stallone, and Kiss. Yeah, that's that's a hell of a career. What's he doing nowadays? Um, I don't know what he's. I I think it's just kind of um, like playing some live shows when he when he could, you know, pre COVID. Well, but before um, it, yeah. But what I saw, I think he was like playing some festival dates in Europe. Does like you know the odd solo album every now and then. Nice. Um, I mean, you know, I, I don't check it on him too frequently, but like every time I've ever bothered, like, oh, he's doing something new. Oh, he's still great. Got it. <laughs> Hell yeah. So how are how are you uh, enjoying the uh, the covid season? Uh, how How's work? <laughs> oh, you know, I mean, it's well, uh... I haven't touched base with you in a in a while where, um, you know, previously, you know, you had a side gig. Does that side gig even exist with covid now? Oh no, 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 no! I'm, I'm, I'm not at that, uh, the, uh, that place at, at, at the moment, and probably won't be till. Like, do you have a side? Are you, are you employed at all? Oh, I'm teaching drum lessons. Yeah, on, online. You know, they're, they're Skype lessons. Uh, doing that, and that's good. And I got, I got my Patreon. That's uh, sweet, sweet Patreon money. I make a whole like twenty-seven dollars a month on Patreon. Hey. Which uh, I... almost covers the cost of the Patreon exclusive videos. Oh, no, there it, you it, go. it does. Yeah. It's like if you want to do like reactions to stuff that they don't allow on YouTube, it's like twelve bucks a month, um, because you have to you have to do a Vimeo account. Because even if you like make it not oh, public God. on YouTube, it'll still get blocked. Yep. Yeah. I had a playthrough uh, where I I played uh, I. I did a drum like a drum karaoke of uh, calling Doctor Love, and then at the end uh, uh, started obnoxiously soloing over it, and it was pretty funny. But it, it got, it, and it was unlisted because it was just from a, my Patreon folk, and it got taken down. Ah oh, man, that's 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 a bummer. So what are the rewards on your Patreon, man? Um, well, uh, they're they're kind of about to be reshuffled uh, because now that I I Twitch stream a lot, the the uh, tier Watch that Gavin I Watch Gavin play video games. Tier is no longer as appealing. Yeah, well, yeah, well, there was one that was going to be like a like a online hangout, you know, one once a month. Uh, but now I, I'm I on Twitch, so times a week. <laughs> yeah, so that that's done. But um, uh, well, my my one dollar is you you just get access to the songs that that I do and you know, like you know the drawings and stuff I put up there, little goofy things. For five dollars, there's like uh, uh, videos from taking on tour. I, I did some like uh, uh, you know set up a camera beside me for for a couple gigs and and took songs from from various shows in the U.S. and Europe. Uh, put those up there. Um, 
some kind of a little bit of behind the scenes kind of stuff, you know, that kind of thing. And then uh, I also sell like lesson blocks on on Patreon as well. Like, uh, you know, you just you, you pay essentially what you would pay me for a month of lessons. And, uh, you know, there's that Patreon tier. Um, I had one and I haven't been able to f- fulfill it. And, and, and thankfully, there aren't many people there really anyone on it. It was going to be I I burn a disc of just kind of little weird ditties and stuff. But. Uh, I have not had a disk drive uh, <laughs> because the computer that I had when I started the Patreon died like the day after I opened it. And then the, uh, you know, n- no computers now, or at least Macs, you know, don't have any, any disk drives on them. So I haven't uh, really been able to, to do that one, but it, it's fun. And I'm, I'm going to reshuffle them around soon. Think of Think of some new ones. So watch that space more on that later so to quote uh, the pot of thunder guys so i have a i have a question for you yeah have um have you gotten to the point where you've i've started to see um less and less appeal of physical media are you seeing less and less appeal of physical media um for, it's funny for myself Yes, I can't think of the last but time. But for you, iPod... the fans, buy my stuff. It, well, I mean, it's it's certainly there if if you want it, and and there seem to be a lot of people. Especially, it seems that the vinyls are are more in demand than the CDs uh, anymore. Well, I think that's because um, vinyls, like if you're having the physical media, they're cooler to look at. They're bigger. You see the artwork better. Hundred percent. Oh, I agree. And and you know, for my kind of nomadic, uh, well used to be nomadic uh and will be again uh uh lifestyle uh a, a vinyl collection just kind of isn't in the cards for me at this moment uh but uh uh yeah i mean uh, yeah i totally get it you know the 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 appeal of vinyl but it, yeah it seems that a lot of people who who buy the physical media i think i think we're moving more vinyl than than cds and i, and I think that's true for a lot of groups yeah um you know we get we actually get requested that like on a semi regular basis like hey can you put your stuff on vinyl I want to buy it and every time we crunch the numbers it's just never enough to it's like expensive yeah, yeah it's like never enough to like we just want to break if we broke even that'd be great but it's always like man we'd be a couple hundred in the hole I don't feel like yeah. being a couple hundred in the hole especially during these times oh um, hell yeah yeah. But it it, yeah. it it is it is frustrating because actually I have like a a whole bunch of CDs uh like that haven't uh, sold like sitting in my closet and so mm. there's a part of me that like felt bad like oh are we not selling CDs because people don't like us anymore or are we not selling CDs because the market has shifted or is it that the market has shifted and people don't like us anymore? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, I mean that's that's one of the many curses of being a creative person is that you can, you can, uh, uh, torture yourself very creatively with, with, uh, uh, lots of, uh, you know, various, you know, does everyone hate what I'm doing? Kind kinds of scenarios. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, back to the, the physical media thing. The reason I was asking yeah. is that, um, I didn't have any streaming services until this year. Mm-hmm. And so just like if I wanted to watch a movie, you know, it'd be what I had in my collection or I would rent it. And, you know, renting would be, you know, more of an experience. It's like, yeah, I'll go to the Red Box and I'll get something or I'll rent something from YouTube for the, you know, like Sonic the Hedgehog. Um, oh, yeah. But uh, now having like Disney Plus, which has access to so many TV shows and movies where mm-hmm. a lot of them I would have considered buying in the past. But it's like, oh, I I don't need to, and I can just watch this whenever I want. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I've like done, you know, some like Netflix, like sign up for a month and quickly cancel, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, uh, but I realized with that, plus the uh, access of streaming for music, you know, it has made a lot of physical media seem like, Oh, do you really need it? I understand why it's declining in society because it's so easy to access this kind of stuff now. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I will say that that since music has become more of a, you know, you you buy your ticket for the month and you can listen to whatever you want on on Spotify or anything. 
you know, there, there have been a number of albums that I've checked out that I know for a fact I probably wouldn't have picked up, you know, if I had to buy the CD. Like, uh, uh, the, the example I always point to is, is Zen Arcade by, by Husker Du. Like, that's an album that I'd always heard a lot about and kind of always been like, ah, okay, you know. Uh, but then when I finally just put it on on Spotify one day, it's a great album. Yeah. It's a great album. And I'd, I'd buy a vinyl copy of that if I, you know, was doing things like that at the moment. But, uh, uh, you know. I mean, there's some Thin Lizzy albums I don't own on physical media, which I know would, like, shock a number of people. Like, what? How does he not have this album? It's like, and it's not even, like, necessarily obscure albums that people don't like. Like, it's not like, oh, it's the first two albums where they were weird and folky. Like, no, there's, like, some albums where it was the band in their prime with the classic lineup, and I just didn't buy because I was broke at the time. I never saw it in the CD store. And then by the time I would have bought it, it's, um, you know, the streaming revolution. It's always available for me to listen to. And it's not like it's a new release where I want to support the artist and make sure they get, like, Phil's, he's fucking dead. Like, so, I mean, the other guys are going to get their royalties, but, like, even Phil's mom is dead. So it's like, you know, as far as the royalties going back to the family, like, they, they pretty much have made their money from it. Yeah. And they're mainly making their money off the boys are back in town being in commercials anyway. They're yeah. are they gonna really make that much from me streaming bad reputation, uh, you know, on on, uh, on YouTube <laughs> music? Probably not. Um but you know, it's it's sort of interesting to think of like what the future value of art is and if um the value of films and uh, you know, visual media goes the same way as music. Uh, and like, if that is going to start declining as well and you know what that means for the future of art. Well, uh, I mean, they've done a better job of like, Hey, you have to pay for it versus I think because music, like you had the whole Napster thing, people got used to it being for free. And with YouTube music, where just like you have the ad model, um, you can essentially still get music basically for free. You're paying with a little bit of your attention, um, and it's usually like, you know, a 10 second ad, so it's not that long. Um, yeah. but like, you know, yeah. with, with, with film and television, there's still that premium. There's still, you know, the Netflix model, the Disney plus model, the Amazon model, just like you have to pay for it. So you have increased value with it. Um, yeah. I don't know. Where do you, well, where do you see things going with physical, with, uh, not necessarily physical media, but in terms of like <laughs> the, the arts and, uh, the value derived from it. Um, well, the, the, <laughs> all all answers to that are certainly made more interesting by the way that this year has gone. You know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. like, uh, 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 I now uh, honestly for movies, I would be surprised if we ever move back to the traditional. A movie comes out to a theater, then it goes away for a while, and then it comes out on home release. You know what I mean? I think that 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 model has pretty much been destroyed. Uh, uh, you know, in, in that I think we're going to see a lot more either simultaneous release, you know, of like, yeah, it's in theaters, but you can also rent it at home, you know, stream it at home, uh, uh, that kind of thing, uh, or I'm, just I'm, direct I'm, still, to... I'm skeptical on that. Well... Just because, like, the 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 VOD uh, hybrid thing yeah. hasn't worked completely well. Like, if it was like, if it was like a smash success... I would maybe lean more towards that, but the fact that like the numbers have been like all over the place and inconsistent, and like some of these you know VOD things have flopped, and sometimes the the hybrid release has worked for some, but they're still not making as much as they would have with a theatrical run. So yeah. that, well, but you know, I'm I'm I'm, the... I'm skeptical on that, but I'm sorry, go on. Oh no worries, I, I mean yeah, I know that. Especially Disney with with Mulan that just came out. Oh, that, that They're just, supposedly not. They flopped just, mid time. Like it flopped. Yeah, but it, but also, but it was so, I'm also it's glad not supposed it did. to be a good movie. Well, <laughs> yeah. So, I, so the thing is, I'm I'm I think that it is ultimately bad for the market for streaming services to start offering premium content where you pay extra for exclusives on their platforms. Like of Netflix, like if you want to watch this movie, it's an extra twenty bucks. Um, yeah. I think that is ultimately bad for the consumer. And so mm. um, that I I don't uh, like. And also like the thing with the Uyghurs in China. Um, 
Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I know that That's... Disney ultimately, you know, isn't, um, you know, colluding with the Chinese government necessarily. You know, they're like, we have to film these scenes in a place that looks like China. We filmed in China. And so it's like, you know, how much, you know, if if I was like in the country itself where I know that I'm not allowed to say shit lest I go to jail, I might not say it while I'm in the country. Um, and so like I, you know, like <laughs> if you're right next to the concentration camp, you're like, oh, man, uh, I just I don't want to get thrown in there. Uh, and it's not the best use of my, like, political capital to do that. Maybe I'll say something once I get back home, once I'm safe. But, like, you as a person in that situation, like, there's not much you can do. Mm. Um, and, you know, so unless you're doing, like, some underground railroad shit and you're just acknowledging you're just going to be a fugitive living your life on the edge doing that kind of stuff, um, you know, like there, there's limited things you can do in those situations. So I understand, like, why the people working on the film crew didn't, like, you know, try to break people out of camps necessarily, because um, you know, going going to war with a with a rival country just seems like a bad idea. So, like, I get it, especially for a film crew. <laughs> yeah, especially for a film crew. <laughs> but I also yeah. understand how, like, in you know, silence can be like an implicit endorsement or at least not oh, a condemnation. Course. And you know, that, yeah. but that's like a problem across American industries. Like, you know, Disney just happened to film there, but basically every other you know major film company is silent on Chinese abuses. The NBA, you know, is famously silent on Chinese abuses. So many of them. Um, mm. Because we've just, um, we're in this really terrible trade agreement with them, which is something that uh, Trump actually got right, that our trade agreement with China is terrible. <laughs> uh, you know, broken clock is right twice a day. <laughs> well, twice a day is a bit of a uh, stretch. But what I'm saying is, uh, I think that the uh, the political nature of the film um yeah. And also that I don't like where it's set, um, like the business model of potentially mm -hmm. charging the consumers more for premium content. I feel that we already live in an, enough of an oligarchical society that, um, like, one of the last things that, like, you know, the general working class has is entertainment. Like, you know, at least we can be distracted with our streaming services during the nightmarish hellscape when we barely have enough food <laughs> on the table. Um, yeah. And so if you take that away from them, too, like, I do fear, like, you know, bloody revolution in the streets. Um, <laughs> like, you know, just do, you know, give the working class a bone. Uh, and so I feel like that is, uh, it would be a bad precedent. So I'm glad that it didn't do well because I think that precedent would be bad. Um, all that being said, I think that overall, um, you know, all corporations are mixed bags, but I think that overall the Disney corporation is a lot less corrupt than people say it is. Like, I think they do actually a lot of positive things. Um, yeah. so I, I, I have mixed feelings on that, but I feel like, um, you know, Disney, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. It's it's a major corporation. It's as it's as it's as good as a major corporation can be, especially yeah. a major American corporation dealing in international trade. Well, I mean, Disney is is such a a an easy target to make because they they go for such a kind of a wholesome image, and they have the theme parks and stuff like that. And da -da -da -da. Right. so it's so easy for for people to you know oh this. It's a, th it's a theme park where every everything's fake, like everything's yeah. Of course, it's a fucking theme park. Yeah, that's they're, what they do. They're, yeah, they're not actually. They're, yeah, what? yeah. Well, like uh, with the theme park thing, people were criticizing Disney for opening, um, or opening too oh, early. They but should Univer not have opened. But also, Universal was open for like two months before Disney reopened, and no yeah. one said a damn thing. Um, and uh, Disneyland here in California has not. Uh, reopen right and uh, so it was only in florida where everything's right. fucked up anyway right and you know to you know and i've heard i don't think they should have reopened but from what i've heard they've actually like reopened better than a lot of other places in the country so mixed feelings on yeah. that yeah I, I mean, in general I, I, I don't think we should be reopening period so oh, of course you know, yeah, it's nice true. that they did a better job with it than other people, I guess. But it's still <laughs> you shouldn't reopen in general. So, 
But, but once again, like, no one said a damn thing about Universal being open and just, like, not having basically any guidelines, just, like, letting you do whatever. So at least, yeah. at least Disney was like, no, we're going to do, like, the social distancing and have spacing and do what we can with that. Like, it's still not enough. You still shouldn't do it. Yeah. But, you know, it's like that, that double standard thing. Yeah. 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 Disney is just such a, you know, they're, they're such a many faced target. Right. In, in the world. Yeah. And, I, and it's, and it's easy to do it because also like there's a lot of brand loyalty with Disney. Like I've got my freaking Olaf paint and my wife, you know, gave me uh, back there. So like there's, there's that brand loyalty aspect to it. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And also, I don't want to be just, like, a show who just, like, defends, you know, this thing I like when it's, like, it's clearly in the wrong. So, like, you know, the the, the KISS fans who would defend Gene and Paul no matter what and will always toe oh, yeah. the, co the company line. Yeah. And so, like, I don't want to just toe the company line no matter what and blindly say it. And especially because, like, I know that, like... I'm writing a script that I hope to pitch to Disney. So like I want sure. to, right. to work with them and make money with them. And I respect what they do most of the time, but I feel like you have to have that balance of like, where is your integrity? Where do you say like, Hey, I like what you do most of the time, but this thing I have a problem with. And I think if I don't say it, it is being dishonest and not having integrity. And like, you know, yeah. that, 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 that can be tricky. Um, and a lot of people don't have the balls to do it. They don't have the balls to, you know, call out things with, and they, you know, they see BS. Like it's, it's a, it's a tricky deal. Like people just always like are all in for their side, and never now is like when their side does something wrong. Um, like with politics, like you know, Trump people, they're, like they're they're all in for him. He's like the, he is our dude. Zero complaints. He is nailing yeah, have, everything. Versus they have hitched their wagon to that to that sinking ship right. so hard. <laughs> but versus like libs, like there's much more dissension amongst the ranks. Like there, it's not just like you you give us anything and we're happy. Like basically, like, generally with the Republicans, they are all behind their candidate no matter what. They are unified and there's not that much dissension in the ranks. And that's actually sort of a strong suit of the conservative right is that they're able to do that. They're able to unify in such a way. Um, yeah. because they, they can win elections that way. Like the fact that they're just like, you know, they will vote red no matter what. Well, but I, I think the, the, the kind of the flaw in, in that is that sometimes oh, no, it, leads they, to inte uh, it leads to intellectual laziness and bad ideas and lack of evolution of in the party. So I and mean, 2020, <laughs> right. Yeah. And that's not to say there aren't some very good conservative ideas and that, you know, some of the stuff on the left is, isn't wonky bullshit. Like, you oh, know, yeah, of course, of course. It's, uh, it's you know, yeah. I, I you, you have to say that every time because I was just like, he's just a radical leftist. Like, man, I voted for McCain in 08. So, like, you know, you know, get off. Oh, me, yo. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's like, oh, man, like Greg can have, uh, you know, nuance. But the thing is. You know, it's like I have, I have conservative friends who criticize Obama, and I'm always annoyed because they criticize him for the wrong reasons. <laughs> it's like, oh, man, he was a radical yeah. socialist and undid everything Bush did. I'm like, nah, dog. He was a terrible uh, president because he kept doing everything that Bush did but was just more competent at it. That's why he was a terrible president. <laughs> uh, but – um. Uh, but, you know, but the thing is with, with liberals, like, you're much more willing to say, you know, have people say, like, man, uh, I don't like – you're much more likely to hear liberals say, I don't like Joe Biden or I don't like Hillary Clinton, but I'm still voting for them, but I just need to because the other option is that much worse. Oh, yeah. But yeah. There, there's, there's much more dissension amongst the ranks, much more frustration uh, versus – on the right, they just seem to be more like more pumped about their dudes, even when their dudes are actually ideologically different. Like there were a lot of dudes who were pumped about Romney, and a lot of those dudes are pumped about Trump, and like don't recognize how they're ideologically incredibly different. Yeah. But you know, hey, yeah. uh, and also uh, him like. The religious right being so into Trump is a really weird thing. Like this guy who's clearly an atheist from New York. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's well, you know, he he does uh, 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 photo ops well, and you know, he, he can he can look the part. So they're they're behind him. So uh, who do you think is going to win this election, buddy? 
Oh, uh, well. I mean, I. I, I, I kind of oscillate on that all the time. I think you know it's uh, I mean? Billy because Corgan with the steel chair coming in. There you go. That, you know what? I, well, ooh, <laughs> I don't know. Given, given things Billy has said in the past uh, 15 years. Yeah. I, ooh, I don't know. But, uh, uh, I mean, I certainly know who I, uh, Ace uh, Frehley for president. Oh, <laughs> no, it, no. I mean, Just I send I a rocket over there. Curly. <laughs> <laughs> it'll come off my guitar neck uh but I, I you know i certainly want joe to win and and he's who who i'm i'm voting for uh uh and there are times where i think he's gonna win but i'm also a very big pessimist uh and cynical person so i i dread the worst yeah i i um, i i truthfully you know it, it's hard to tell these things I truthfully think that he's going to win because, you know, typically an incumbent president, when it's not during a war, it's a referendum on how they're doing economically. Mm. Um, that's that's typically how it goes. And usually the incumbent has um, the advantage just by, like, name recognition. Um, so the incumbent usually has the advantage. Now, uh, in this case, we actually are in several wars, but the media hides them so well that it's treated like a non-war uh, time, um, <laughs> uh, which, you know, that's a whole other really shady story. The fact that, like, we're no longer allowed to uh, take pictures or film like uh, coffins coming back from war. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. So if that was legal, you'd probably see uh, a lot more of those pictures and we probably wouldn't be in so many damn wars all the time. Um, but what I would say is... So Trump was doing at was probably set up to win, um, because enough of his base, like we're talking about, how awesome their four hundred one ks were, um, like he a lot of like upper middle class people benefited from the Trump presidency, and I actually benefited economically from the Trump presidency, which was actually a surprise to me, in hmm. that um, so I work for a company that was not doing so well in a number of years. And so they did a pay freeze on employees and just didn't give raises. Um, oh, wow. And then uh, the Trump tax cut kicked in and they just applied that to give us a raise so that we would stay with the company. Um, so I, uh, uh, and that's what they said that the tax cuts would do. Most companies mm -hmm. actually did not give their employees raises. They actually just profited it for like the, the higher ups in the company and did not give raises to the employees but my company was actually one of the few companies where, like, what they said in theory would happen actually happened. So if you hmm. look, like, across the board at the data, that's not what happened for most people. Yeah. But it actually happened for me. So I was someone who actually directly benefited from a Trump presidency. My position was better because of Donald Trump as president. Um, and so voting against Trump would actually uh, potentially be against my economic interest in some ways. But if I'm looking at it like from a broader societal standpoint, um, the other shoe, I, in my opinion, would drop and that that uh, temporary benefit from his presidency would lapse as other societal issues would ultimately hurt me more economically in the long run. Um, yeah. Which is often sort of the, the case with a uh, liberal versus conservative of just like short term games versus the, the long uh, long term big picture versus – in general, the liberals are like, what's going to be the long-term big picture approach? And conservatives are like, hey, man, how can I just make my money right now and like not yeah. think about how this is going to affect someone <laughs> in 10 years uh, with like, all the environmental stuff? And so you know, that's how I looked at it with um, the Trump presidency. But like, I, I was someone who directly benefited from it. But with COVID, it's pretty much unanimously known. He dropped the ball on it and just like oh, was completely yeah. incompetent with it. The fact that there was – no central federal response like yeah. when the, there needed to be because the inconsistency of leaving it up to the states turns out does not work during a global pandemic. Yes. That, yeah. And with the, the release of those Woodward tapes, he knew how bad this thing was. And the fact that he knew how bad it was and was still that incompetent is actually pretty impressive. Uh <laughs> that, you have to work at, at that kind of of, of of incompetence, yeah. Yeah, so I think that combined with, I think that Joe Biden is actually, like, we're recording this before the debate. I don't know if I'll get this out before the debate. 
Um, and so I will potentially be eating crow. Um, but I think that Joe Biden will actually do well in the debate. Um, I think I, so too. I think that people overplay um, how much Joe is losing it in his old age. We're just like, if you oh, just yeah. watch Joe Biden, his political career, he's always said stupid shit. Like, yeah. what Joe Biden is stumbling over his words, that's just Joe Biden. Like, yeah, George that's, W. That's... Bush did that during his entire presidency, and people just thought he was stupid. Um, that's just like... What's... I made little page-a-day calendars out of, out of those right. quotes, yeah. And so I think that's more the case with Biden, so I don't think it's senility. I think he's still there. Um, oh, yeah. And so I think the, he, the fact that he will just do, like, competent at the debate, and also he's much more willing to, like, talk shit than Hillary Clinton is, where... Yes. Yeah, and I think that will benefit him at the debate because, like, Trump fans will actually respect that someone will like give Trump shit and not bat down. Um, yeah, he'll get in the mud a little bit more. He'll yeah. get in the mud, and they, like, do you do you see that video of the Biden campaign rally where someone was giving him shit and he challenged him to a push-up contest? <laughs> <laughs> and this was from like early this year, so this was like yeah. this campaign cycle. Someone was giving Biden shit. It's like, you know what, man? Let's just do push-ups right here. And, like, it was a fat guy. So, like, Biden was just, like, trying to... <laughs> but the thing is, like... <laughs> that's the kind of thing a Trump voter respects. Just, like, pure, shit, you know what? unabashed, yeah. you know, jungle maleness. That makes no <laughs> sense. Yeah, no shit. Yeah. So, like, if, if Joe Biden just, like, you know, says, you know, here's the deal, Jack. I can do more push-ups than you, so I'm more fit to be president, literally. Get on the ground, fat ass, and you won't be drinking Diet Cokes and McDonald's every day. <laughs> yeah. It'd be an exciting debate. Yeah, so, <laughs> but, so that's, that's what I think. I think that Biden is going to talk shit. And people's minds are going to be blown. And like, what? I can't believe he talks shit. I'm just like, what he does. He's just going to talk it, shit. Yeah. He's going to say some quips. And then people are going to be like, whoa, I guess he is with it. And people are going to vote for him. And on top of like the, you know, miserable economic failure, I think that's going to be Trump's um, undoing. And um, mm. then I think Biden will probably be an ineffective president and do a terrible job. And it'll be... Uh, Bad, but not quite as bad. It, yeah, things, things. I think in a lot of ways, things will not get worse. Uh, but the thing is, I'm, I think... I, I'm still expecting. Um, honestly, the future looks uh, pretty bleak. Um, with the, the with the court being even more conservative. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not even as. I'm not just concerned with like the civil rights of just like okay. Uh, gay marriage uh, wheeling back and abortion wheeling back. Um, as a working class American, um, like, hey, are you ready for arbitration law to become even worse, folks? <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Are you ready for corporations yeah. to have even more power? Turns out corporations have more rights than people do. Will be like, they're you know, the way they'll lean. Super people. Yeah. They're super people. Um, <laughs> like, uh, it's, it's going to be really bad in terms of like the uh i think wealth inequality is gonna skyrocket i think things are going to uh ultimately get a lot worse with that um i know well, that's I, been trending upwards but no I, I think it's gonna decade. like i yeah. think it's gonna like hit in the gas oh, pedal Shendo. Oh, yeah no yeah. it's gonna be um like the fact that we've been you know hanging on by a thread in a number of ways, I think that thread is going to snap. But also, RBG was also pretty pro-business in her court ruling, so actually it might not be as catastrophic as uh, one might think. And not like Merrick Garland was going to be like that much. Uh, uh, like like he wasn't <laughs> going to be a, a, a pro-corporatist dude anyway, so, you know. Uh, but, yeah. you know, long story short, we're in the bad timeline. Pretty much. This is the mirror universe. Uh, you can tell because I have a goatee. Ah, yes. Mm. <laughs> well, on that bleak note, do you want to do some plugs? Sure. Um, you can find me. I play drums in a band named Bent Knee. Uh, you can find us at bentneemusic.com or on all of the various social media platforms uh, at Bent Knee Music. 
uh, on you know the Twitter and the Instagram uh, and all that. Uh, I have a Patreon, so if you go to Patreon slash Gavin WA, uh, you can go there, sign up, have some fun, come hang out with me on Twitch. Uh, for that, you just go to GavinWA.live, uh, and that'll take you over to uh, my Twitch stuff. Um, yeah, let's see, what else, what else? I'm on the lipstick p- uh, panel quite a bit, so oh, listen yeah, to that. People on my channel don't even know about that. Oh really? Uh, some do. There is one guy on my channel because we uh, we took that break to have Victor listen to the Kiss catalogs. Like I'm yeah. on your channel now because I missed the podcast. Ah, nice. Yeah, uh, well. man, that that show is weird. Um, the fact that that was like just a commercial for the band and then just kept the band on life support all this time. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's you know it's great. When it's is great. Bentney gonna do a podcast? Uh, you know, we, I don't know. Um, I want to say like way back first album, it, it was an idea that we flirted with, but never actually did anything with it. Uh, I think at this point we we're, we're, we just are on a bunch of podcasts. So you can kind of all think of those as, as one long uh, one long podcast series broken up amongst many different feeds. Well, you could just download all the episodes and start your own RSS feed called the Bet Knee Podcast. Oh, you know what? That's a good point. And just kind of have it be like a like a like a like a central hub of all, yeah. all shows that any of you us have been do on. That, That'd be cool. And you could uh, like intro the episodes to explain the context for the different shows. <laughs> for this interview, we were in Germany and very tired. Right, or like, uh, and for this episode, we watched Sonic the Hedgehog on the lipstick panel. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited for that one to come out. And I, I, you know, honestly, when I went to bed last night, I almost uh, put that movie on again. I watched, like, it, watch uh, it. I watched it with my wife afterwards. <laughs> nice. Um, so yeah, that's um, three times I've seen it. You know what? I, I like it. I like it. Um, it's not as good as the, the other movie I watched three times recently um, that I with hadn't seen before. That being... That was Hamilton. Oh, okay. Have yeah, you seen that? I, I, I've seen... I saw the first half. I made it up to the intermission break. Ah. Uh, uh, and then I went to bed because it was pretty late. Get, uh, uh, if you yeah. watch the second half, uh, it's not as... Um, what would I... How would I describe it? You know, there's... Uh, if Act 1 is the rise, Act 2 is the fall. Oh, that makes sense, yeah. And, like, you know, I know he dies at the end. Yeah, I've it's, had that uh, spoiled. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's work because history. Oh, I, I, right, you know what? I, you know what? Podcast isn't over. I've got some ranting to do. Ooh. All right, spoilers. People who care about them, I. It's such bullshit, dude. It is absolute bullshit. Especially, I've had people complain about spoilers for history. That just means you're an uneducated fool. Yeah, no, that's like like spoilers I mean, for like biopics. A... I'm just like, no, no. Yeah, that... yeah no. Yeah, that's not how that works. <laughs> yeah, no, that's not how that works. But also, like, um, I told you about the the, uh, the person who I guarantee you has to have unfriended me at this point. There is no reason that person would keep me as a friend um, who, like, complained where I, you know, gave spoilers for Infinity War. Thanos does Thanos things that he's famous for in this movie. Oh, God, yeah. You can't, yeah. No. And, and he got really upset, like, you, you spoiled this movie I've been waiting for for years. Like, what'd you think Thanos was going to do in this movie? Yeah, like, I mean, really, the only but mystery you know, he got from... he got so pissed off with me. Oh, wow. I, yeah. And he got pissed off with me with an, uh, another thing. Like, he's, like, more of an acquaintance who, like, <laughs> is a higher level of celebrity than me. So I would be very surprised if he hadn't unfriended me at this point out of just, like, annoyance of any time he saw me on his feed. Was it Roger Taylor? It, no, it wasn't Roger Taylor. Uh, let me put it this way. <laughs> it is a famous uh, YouTuber um, who a, – a, a, a very famous YouTuber who, whose work you definitely know, whose work you probably like. Um, is it PewDiePie? It's not. No, because I don't like PewDiePie. Right? Uh, it's I, not I, I, anyone I've been on episode. a – Okay. It's, Have it's, I been on a podcast with this person? No, this person would probably oh. not be on my podcast. Um, oh, okay. probably would. Like, man, 
it's a real bummer when, like, you meet someone and they give a good first impression, and you think that this is a, a person who could potentially be in your life, like, as a friend and someone you can bond with, and, mm-hmm. um... And then you realize the first impression was actually just wrong. And that, oh, yeah. No, and, that's... Yeah, that always sucks. And, like, when you... Because, uh, you know, there are some people who, like, you know, give a, a bad first impression. Then you get to know them and understand their uh, quirks and nuances. Like, oh, there's more to this person than meets the eye. Um, but it's a real bummer when, like, it's the opposite. And you see, like, the spark of, like, an interesting good person whose soul you want to explore and could see, like, a potential lifelong friendship with. And yeah. then it's just like, oh, no, you're just an angry nerd guy. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that that would be upsetting. Yeah, yeah. Like it, it, it was a bummer because like we we hit it off like so well when we first met and mm-hmm. like talked about like collaborating and doing stuff and um then like when the first time I actually like bothered to call him, he's like, "Who gave you this number?" I'm like, "You did." Oh shit! <laughs> you gave me this number and said if I have a collaboration idea to call you, so I did. <laughs> And got real upset, like, you know, next time, you know, email me and my handler will, you know, handle it. And I'm like, oh, boy. And I'm like, all right, w- whatever, bro. I'm sorry that I figured I could use this phone number you gave me. <laughs> and told me to use. Yeah. No, right. that's, but, that's uh, but yeah, so that's yeah. the So that, w- that, that was my last encounter with him before the Infinity War thing on Facebook. So uh-huh. I just assume, given that, uh, he's probably unfriended me at this point. <laughs> But also, like, I'm not, I'm not too worried about that. I feel like that networking opportunity wasn't really going anywhere. <laughs> sounds like it, yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah uh, like... for me, uh, spoilers ultimately don't matter. If a story is told well enough, you can revisit that story again and again, and the spoilers don't matter. I, I'll disagree with that. Uh, case in point for me is is Sixth Sense. I enjoyed I had... it while watching it. I had that spoiled for me, and and as a result, the whole film just felt like a deflated balloon. Eh, I liked it, and I I knew the spoilers going in. I feel like if something is done well enough, it can still give you that emotional impact. So, uh, let me just think of a a random example. Okay, so, uh, let's say Transformers, the the 80s movie. I haven't seen it. Um... But there were a number of people who said that, you know, they cried when Optimus Prime died in the movie. Spoilers, by the way, yeah. for a movie from the 80s. <laughs> I've been waiting my whole life for that movie. Spoilers for a children's <laughs> film from the 80s that you probably should have seen by now if you wanted to. <laughs> um, but they say that every time they watch the movie, they they cry when Optimus dies. Yeah. Um, and so just because something is spoiled for you doesn't mean that it can't still have emotional impact when it comes up in the media. No, that's true. I I, I agree with that. But also, I, I feel like, I mean, at least for me, I, I would hate knowing that if it was a franchise I gave a shit about, uh, you know what I mean? Like, like like uh like a star wars spoiler or, well i didn't or, ex- i didn't experiment for frozen 2 where i went in without spoilers uh-huh. and um i probably did not enjoy the movie as much because i was too really? busy like trying to analyze everything that was happening you were going on the journey of the film right yeah <laughs> you were experiencing the film the way they wanted you to right <laughs> um <laughs> But because of that, um, yeah. like the the way that I you know often consume art is like I'm considering like you know what it's, what does this mean for the character? Like I'm examining from also the perspective of like an artist and storyteller, and not just like mm-hmm. going along for the ride. And yeah. so I'm too busy like analyzing that stuff to just be taken in by the emotion sometimes. Okay. Um, but then again, like you know, it still made me cry, and then I cried you know the the other times from watching the film. Um, but like knowing the ending and spoilers for a film doesn't ruin moments for me. Like there, don't get me wrong. There are moments where like genuine surprise from not having spoilers have like made things very magical for me. Mm. Um, so like, um, and it's actually happened a couple times in video games where, um, uh, in Donkey Kong Country 2, have you played that? No, I've only played a little bit of the first one. Okay. So do you want some spoilers for Donkey Kong Country 2? Uh, sure. Yeah. Okay, so uh, you get to the last world in the video game where, like, the yeah. entire, you know, you have the world map, and the the last big item you see on the world map is a castle. 
and then you go mm-hmm. to the castle world, and that entire world is traveling up to the top of the castle. Yeah. And then, like, you know, you get to the castle, and, like, the level is called, like, Final Showdown, and you see K. Rule, and, like, all right, sweet, we're doing this. And um, then he just, like, flies out, like, on an airplane and leaves the castle, and then there's, like, a, a vine or, like, something that you climb up outside of the castle, or, like, you know, you're climbing a, lo- a rope ladder that's attached to the plane, and then you're in, like, a sky world for a couple levels, and my mind was blown when I went there. <laughs> Because I thought, like, the, this is clearly the final boss. Everything's been building up to it. We're at the top of the castle. Yeah. It says final showdown. And I was like, and I was like, you know, it looked like a final boss. I was like, all right, I'm ready for this shit. And I'd seen, like, um, pictures of the final boss days, and it looked pretty much the same. Um, but, like, it, they, they got me. And, I was, yeah. and my mind was blown. And the thing is, it was a game I never beat. So, like, I had it as a kid, got to the final world, and just never beat the final boss. Like, eh, you know, one of those games, like, you mean to be as a kid never do. And so, I, as an adult, like, I'm just going to get this done and beat it. Yeah. And so, the fact that there was this secret for over 20 years of my life and something that I thought I knew. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's wonderful. That's and wonderful. And my mind yeah. was just blown by, like, what? Everything I thought I knew about the world was a lie. <laughs> 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 and the fact that there was this secret. Yeah. And something I loved, which was like one of my favorite video games as a kid. And it was like, yes, this game is a masterpiece, even though I never beat it, I loved it. And the fact that that was there the whole time. And like the fact that there was like an entire new world in this thing, like, what? This was here? <laughs> <laughs> so then how do you how do you deal with like like mystery movies or 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 things that are like, like for instance, are like Twin Peaks. Are you a Twin Peaks fan? Never consumed it. Oh, okay. Well, you should. It's very, very good. Um, so I'm a I'm a big Sherlock Holmes fan. Um, uh-huh. Arthur Conan Doyle is probably my favorite author in terms of the prose that he uses. Um, mm-hmm. but the way that I uh, view it is that um, I don't care so much about solving the mystery myself. I just care about like a good story being told. Okay. Yeah. So I will reread. I've like I've read Hound of the Baskervilles many many times. I've watched mm-hmm. many different film adaptions of Hound of the Baskervilles. Like I know who did it. Spoilers. It was yeah. fucking Stapleton. Yeah. Like I know who did it, but I still go back to it because it's a good story. Um, and so I think too many things are just like concerned with like is it a good mystery for one time consumption? And I think that's why the mystery genre as a whole probably isn't very good. The thing mm-hmm. is, Doyle c- told good stories that happen to be mysteries. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I, I agree. Like, I'm not like a, you know, who's that author who's putting out, like, a mystery novel a week or whatever, that Patterson? Yeah, I've James never read Patterson. any of the stuff. Um, yeah, so, no, so, I'm not like, like, I mean, you know, I tend to prefer more, like, Sherlock Holmes movies and, and uh, uh, a lot of David Lynch stuff are mysteries in very weird senses yeah i tend to not like lynch um i thought seven oh, was, really? i thought seven was good that's lynch right no that's david fincher oh fincher okay so what's what's that's lynch? the other the other david david lynch did uh blue velvet was he fight club um, drive no that that's also david fincher okay uh, okay so yeah so uh, i hated fight club um but i i was never a big fan i was never a big fight club guy it just felt like um the the dumbest kind of nihilism so nihilism. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it was, it was, it, well, to me, I just saw it become such this weird power fantasy for so many people. And to me, that was not the point of that story. So I almost, Oh, see the point of the story wrong. I thought was dumb. Like I, I thought like the core, like the message they were trying to get across was a dumb message. Oh, I see. I, I, Kind of, uh, I, I kind of thought it worked on on, and it, then again, I haven't seen this since the seventh grade. But I first I, watched I, it I, as a teenager, so that might have had something to do with it. Yeah, same here. Yeah, it was yeah seventh grader. Well, well like so older, beginning of my teen years. I, I might have seen like you're, maybe like uh, junior year of high school. So like if you're like less impressionable, you might be like this yeah. is bullshit. Oh wait, but wait, I, I wait seventh couple, grade is is um yeah middle school. Okay, yeah. So, but I, I didn't come away from that film liking any character in that movie. I, 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 I took it as more of a cautionary tale of what that kind of 
of of horribleness can bring you to. You know what I mean? Or, or maybe not so much a cautionary tale, but but it, it it I didn't come out of it going, "Wow, that Tyler Durden." was so brave and I, interesting. I, I, I think the problem is, like, some of that stuff glorifies it, though. Like, Scarface should be a cautionary tale, but the fact that, like, every, like, you know, frat boy douchebag just has the Scarface oh, poster, poster on his on his yeah. wall without yeah, any yeah. sense of irony about why it's a bad idea. And they're just like, man, if you just, like, you know, grab life by the balls and treat people like shit and are mean, everything will work out for you. Yeah, you'll you'll get gunned down in in Florida. At they some they point. don't think about that yeah, part. They just think about less, like you'll get the hot girls and you'll get all the drugs. It'll be great. Yeah, and it's they they they, they, they yeah. take that lesson from it. And so like for me, I I think the world would be a better place if Scarface as a film did not exist. Like I legitimately believe that. Like I as an artist believe you have the right to make whatever kind of art you want. But I can mm-hmm. also believe certain things would be better if they didn't exist. Scarface, I think, <laughs> like, well, society and humanity yeah. as a whole, like, think about just, like, how, like, if, if if you're a person who saw that in your formative years and thought it was awesome and wanted to be like that dude, like, you're, <laughs> you're a terrible person. You're, you just are. <laughs> yeah. Well, I but, I, but I think, I mean... There are so many movies where I think people kind of come away and and that I mean, I, I think people a lot of people naturally gravitate towards villainous characters anyway. You know what I mean? Yeah, but you, you like I feel like when you <sighs> because honestly, I, I feel like in 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 a in a few years, uh, uh, Joaquin Phoenix's Joker is very much going to be that kind of film. You know, I think I think you're right. But also, I think that um I think that's a much better movie. Um, I agree. I think I agree. It's, a, it's a much better character study. Um, yeah. And I think it's also much more clearly condemning of the character in the end. We're saying, like, you, you understand why this happened, but it is still, like, you are meant to be horrified by what this character is by the end of it. Yes. I mean, he he wins that movie. Right. He wins that and... movie, but it's a, you're, it's not... It's not it, glorious necessarily. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. so I think and, it's 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 as well done as you could without you you don't want to glorify it. Like I think it's it was the appropriate take you could have taken for that. Whereas I think Scarface just kind of glorified it. See, but I, I I still and then again I haven't seen this Scarface since I saw it I in my college. I saw it uh, when I first moved to Nashville, so I would have been like twenty two, twenty three. Okay, I would have been. Probably eighteen, nineteen, or twenty, because it would have—it was my one of my first years of college. So yeah, so it's—it's it's been maybe like eight years since I've seen it. Yeah, but and like I, I certainly—I mean, I wasn't sad at the end when Tony Montana was gunned down. It just felt more like a natural progression of that kind of world that he immersed himself in, and and it was the the tragic ending to a series of bad choices. I just, but I also think that obviously, I mean, I'm not disagreeing with you that there are a lot of people who like saw that film and went, "I want to be like that guy." You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah and, I, you know, I, you I don't that. say that. I don't think that it should necessarily. Like, I wouldn't say ban the movie. Just but, wipe it from memory and existence. <laughs> I, I'm just saying that, like, if if there's a parallel timeline where Scarface never came out, Donald Trump might not be president. Is what I'm saying. <laughs> 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 That's a good. That's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah. But also, you know, there is something to you know consider, like you know, what is fundamentally the nature of the, you know the country in which we live in. You know, is Scarface one of the most American movies uh, that exists? And if you think about it, you know, this country exists because of like a genocide of you know people who lived on this continent before and slavery. Um, yeah. Mixed in with um, rugged individualism, which just means like, hey, man, corporations are awesome. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and so like the fact that like that's the ideals that the country is based upon, you know, I won't, uh, you know, to be fair, there are some very positive ideals that are also in the core of the country. And so it makes it um, much more of a mixed bag. But, you know, I had a friend of mine who's a, like a you know, he's a historian and like, you know, that's what he does all the time. He's just like studies history. And he says that he thinks that the 
fundamentally, at the core, America is an evil country. And I don't necessarily agree with him because I think there's a lot of good that is at the core of America. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I understand how he came to that assessment. And I don't just think he's being just like one of those hypercritical libs who's like, you know, trashing on history. Like, (laughs) there is a lot, I think, in the psyche of America that is like deeply flawed, deeply problematic, and is like at the core of the country. Like, the rugged individualism, while in many cases is actually very positive and good for people and good for building self-esteem and following dreams and building a better society, in a number of ways it has made us a cruel, heartless, callous society. And so I think it's important to acknowledge that that intense focus on rugged individualism has made a lot of people um, less concerned with the plight of others. And the yeah. fact that there isn't really a core national identity and something that really ties people together. Uh, Because with other nations, like there is at least like a biological lineage that connects people together. Um, Like Germans are, you know, Germans, even if they're German Jews or different, uh, you know, uh, subsets, they're, they still are largely coming from the same biological pool. Mm -hmm. And so there's still that sense of uh, kindredship and community that doesn't exist as much with America, and there's much more viewing as other Americans as the other, as the enemy. There isn't as much of that unification as people would like to believe. That just isn't really intrinsic to the core and founding of the country. And so understanding what led to this, uh, the psyche of this society, I think is important. And so like a film like Scarface coming out of uh, American minds makes sense. And I think that's sort of like, you know, the darker, more troubling, terrifying aspects of the worst parts of the American psyche. But by that same token, a character like Captain America, who sort of embodies all of the good parts of the American psyche and all the ideals we want to live up to, I don't think that America is an evil country, is a lost cause. But you have to acknowledge that, like, you know, there's yin and a yang, and there is yeah. a there is a very deep rooted dark side to America that if you don't no doubt yeah if you don't acknowledge like the imperialism and all that stuff like I think you're just lying and not acknowledging history and I think that a lot of Americans are lying and not acknowledging are, history. are lying and not acknowledging history they're not willing to face that truth but I think a lot of people when they face that truth they just fall complete into the despair thing and don't acknowledge like the good parts either and I think that is also problematic. Um, Truthfully, I think the not acknowledging the bad is more problematic uh, than just like, the blind faith to the good. But like there, there are you know nuance, nuance, yeah. gray areas, red, white, and gray. Greg, you would love Blue Velvet by David Lynch. Would I because though? I, I th- probably not. <laughs> but I think that the the what you're describing, uh, I think, plays into a lot of the. Uh, or at least some of the ways that I view the story. Spoil it for Velvet. me. Uh, well, Blue Velvet is about this 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 all American kid named Jeffrey Beaumont, played by uh, Kyle McLaughlin, who uh, returns to his town, his hometown of Lumberton, uh, to uh, uh, because his his, uh, his 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 father has some sort of illness, but he comes back, and he's he's back for the first time in his hometown since leaving for college. And he finds an ear in a field. And then it becomes where things go after he finds this ear. He gets no, no, involved. No. Spo- spo- in- you need to spoil more for me. That is not enough. Uh, 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 he, because he like thus far, up- you have not sold me on this movie. Thus far, I'm like, yep, don't care. Oh, he, he winds up getting uh, involved with this lounge singer... Uh, named Dorothy Valens, played by Isabella Rossellini, uh, who is involved in nebulous ways with this character named uh, uh, Frank Booth, uh, Anthony, Ho- uh, not Anthony Hopkins, uh, Dennis Hopper. Okay. Uh, who's amazing. Uh, this was his comeback film after he finally cleaned up. Um, and it's, it's. Don't try to not spoil it for me. Like you just, Go hard. Well, see, but that's the thing. It's 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 hard. It's hard to spoil a David Lynch film. Like, like, what's what's the ending? 
uh, uh, like what happens to the main character? Oh, uh, does he uh, die? Jeff, does he, he lives? I uh, what kind of lesson does he learn? He he learns to uh, 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 reconcile the to to live simultaneously with the darker and more lighter parts of of his nature as. And the the opening shot of that film is, is so does, the perfect... does, he just, like, does he just kill somebody and just like I'm okay with I have to kill people to protect my family? No, no, it's not. It's it's. It, he, so you're saying he it's does, not as good as Fast and Furious? Uh, I'm saying it. It is. I've never seen Fast and Furious, but I will say that Blue Velvet is the better movie. Uh, what about uh, Too Fast, Too Furious? Uh, ooh, it has more cars. Well, maybe, maybe not Tokyo Drift. Uh, but, uh, um, no, 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 it, it's the, the opening shot of this film. Cause David Lynch is a very artsy guy, you know? So it, uh. it, it opens with these kind of, but he's also like, see, because I also hate like quote unquote, <laughs> like artsy directors, like, like everyone flipped shit over eternal sunshine of the spotless mind. I saw it. It's fine. Uh, you know what I, I, mean? I watched part of it at a party. I was actually enjoying it, but, um, it's not, not mind blown in any way. It's it's not the yeah 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 Blue, David Lynch, legitimately though I think is is a kind of you know visionary genius and I hate saying those words because it always sounds so like visionary genius but David Lynch is a visionary genius um uh but it, it's it's these these great kind of picturesque uh, middle America nineteen fifties esque kind of, you know, high saturation, uh, high color saturation, you know, white picket fence uh, in, in front of a blue sky, bright red rose, fire truck drives by with a fireman waving. And then there's this long zoom in on the lawn and there's just these these massive bugs under the lawn. You are you are not selling me on this at <laughs> all. See, and, and this is the fundamental flaw because like... No, what, yeah, you you need can... to, what you need to do to sell me on a film, you need to uh-huh. say... You know, here's where here's what the cool twist is. Here's the emotional core, like you know what you will get out of it. You know what the characters do. Like, so let's say this main character, uh, Joe, yeah. main character, has to make Jeff this Belmont. Jeff, main character. Uh, you know, Jeff, every man has to make this decision where you know his morals are compromised, and it's interesting because of this. Um, so like all that stuff of it's just like a, a cool shot. Just like, do not care. <laughs> okay, fair enough. And also describing a cool shot visually is is it's the same way of like, you know, there's this really great Well, you can describe uh, like a cool thing that happened. So like in Rambo yeah. 3, there is a character death. So Rambo is fist fighting this dude. It doesn't go well. And so what does Rambo do? He ends up punching the guy into a hole so he falls into a cave and then he gets caught on a wire and hangs, but that wire is attached to an explosion. So then the guy explodes after he hangs. <laughs> Okay, now I need see, to see Rambo 3 now. Now see yeah. how that sells you on the movie? That's the kind yeah. of shit you need to tell me. Stuff like well, that. Uh, 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 in, in Blue Velvet, this this character has to uh, more or less figure out how to reconcile the darker parts of his personality with the lighter parts in in ways that are a lot more clever than just like, You need to you give know, me a specific example of, of how this Jesus. works. See, but that's so hard to do with like David Lynch. Uh, okay, at, at, describe at, an event that happens in the movie and how it relates to the theme. That's how stories work. Yeah, but but David Lynch is such a weird storyteller. Okay, um, do events uh, okay. happen in the film? Y- yes. Do events happen in the film that correlate to the theme? Yes. Can you describe an event that happens in the film? Badly, but yes. <laughs> There's okay, so so Jeff goes to the the, uh, the 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 lounge singer's house at one point because they've kind of struck up this this weird uh, 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 relationship with each other where they're kind of both in this uh, place of like nurturing each other, but also like yeah, it's just weird. And that that evil guy, the Dennis Hopper guy, shows up and he sees Jeff and he's like, oh, Jeff's here. Well, he doesn't know who Jeff is, but he, he says, we're going to go for a ride. Do you want to go for a ride? And he ends up 
taking them on this long car ride where they go to this 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 house owned by oh uh, 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 the guy I don't know if you ever watched Quantum Leap. Um, not enough to remember it substantially. Like, okay, well, caught reruns as a kid. Yeah, it's, it's gone. Well, the guy who isn't Scott Bakula. That's the only person I would know. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, he was also. Did you ever see the the VH1 made for TV Madonna Life Story movie? I didn't know that existed. Oh, oh! For, first off, that's a treasure trove of American cinema. <laughs> is the made for TV VH1 biopic stories the Meatloaf story? I've seen that. I've seen the Def Leppard one. The Monkeys one. Did you see that one? I did not see the Monkeys one. The monkeys, they're, they're so delightfully terrible. The monkeys one is amazing, uh, uh, as is the Madonna one. The, but, uh, the Def Leppard one I thought was really hilarious because the way that they frame it, uh, have you seen that one? Uh, it's been years. Like, I would have been a kid when I saw it. All right. So you might not have appreciated this as a kid, but as an adult, you will think it's hilarious. So yeah. you know how uh, towards uh, like the latter half of the film, they're working on hysteria, and they have yeah. shots of them in the studio working on material? Yeah. And so there's a song that they keep working on and it's slowly becoming a masterpiece and they're building up and it's not quite right, but it's getting there. And they're playing a little bit of it there and let's say, you know, it's just interspersed throughout the the, the movie. Uh, and then they, you know, the film climax with them finally performing that amazing masterpiece magnum opus live. That song is pour some sugar on me. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> Just like the amount of time they build it up to be the, like this big epic masterpiece of art. That's amazing. That's amazing. Well, that's and that's such a <laughs> that's such a pitfall of like like I don't know if you I'm sure you saw Bohemian Rhapsody. Uh, I did. I I enjoyed it. Um, I know it's it's fine for what it was, right. but to watch it as a musician. In, in, you know, and I'm sure you felt this, or I'm sure... Uh, the, the part that was my favorite part, it was like, man, this, 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 um, this press junket for Hot Space is really intense. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that was what killed me. I was like, there is no way the press gave this much of a shit about hot space. Yeah, it would be this aggressive to Queen. Like, what you <laughs> sell out? What is this bullshit? <laughs> well, and, and for me, it's it's. I wish that there were half as many knowing smirks in the studio during the recording process as that movie would lead you to believe. Because like like the whole scene where they're writing, we will rock you, right? And it's like. You know, Roger Taylor's like, I, I have an idea, or whoever said, whoever had the idea Brian to May. get everyone stomping. Brian May had the idea for stomping and clapping. He he just kind of had that. I have an idea. That kind of knowing smirk thing, and then they're all stomping and clapping, and then like, well, uh, I liked how uh, Freddie was able to party so hard in the '80s that he could travel back in time to the '70s to then write uh, to record "We Were Rock You" after his crazy night of partying in the '80s. Oh my God! Yeah, you know what? I didn't even think about that. That's a good point. Yeah, he he was late from partying in the eighties. Yeah, then <laughs> back in the seventies because he partied that hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I that... noticed more flaws with Bohemian Rhapsody than you did, but I was just like, man, I'm along for the ride. <laughs> yeah, well, and and I'm I'm willing to bet you probably know Queen's total history a lot better than I do. I mean, they're a top ten band for me. So yeah, uh, yeah, I, the I, fact I, I that like, they never broke up. Yeah. Like yeah, that's like I, just I'm, not a thing. Yeah, I'm. I'm Although not I as... did like the mountains of cocaine uh, when Freddie was in the studio doing his solo album. That was great. Yeah. <laughs> well, though, I mean, would would that have been true for him at that time? Uh, probably. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just like it, it's like I really hope that a Kiss autobiography or a Kiss biopic film gets Has off the nothing to do with Gene point. and Paul. No, 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 no. Give them complete control. Oh, that's gonna I, be a terrible movie. Yes, of course it will be, but I want to see that so bad. I want, I, I want, I want the, a Kiss biopic where Gene and Paul do not have creative say over the final product because uh, it's going to be so bad. They're going to give barely any screen time to Ace and Peter. Oh, of course, yeah, yeah. It's it's going to be it's it, yeah, it's a a Kiss biopic film where Gene and Paul have any say won't be anything but a propaganda fluff piece, but also. I kind of really like Kiss propaganda fluff pieces. Like, you ever see Kisteria? 
the, yeah, the, I have. Uh, that was yeah, fun. But, yeah, uh, but I really want to sing Beth. Yeah, I am yeah. a singer. I'm really pushing to sing Beth. Hey, what if we just randomly p- play uh, uh, Melbourne tomorrow night uh, uh, in, in their biggest stadium? I'm sure it's empty, and we can put that together for tomorrow. Doc, you're the manager. Make it happen. Make it happen. <laughs> yeah, like, and, and I, I mean, I'm a sucker for that. I was a sucker for the Gene Simmons family but, jewels. But the, the trick is, I feel like when you have, when you set up a movie that's supposed to have character arcs, and yeah. you have Gene and Paul given final say, I just know they're going to write a bad movie. And it's not going to be so bad it's good. It's just going to be bad. It's going to just be, like, kind of lame, like, inspiration porn, but you're only going to get, like, you know, halfway there. I I just look forward to the to the arc of the Gene and Paul characters being that they have to, they have to realize that they need to stand up for what they believe in and get rid of members of the band who uh, who maybe don't have that same uh, thing in in, uh, in at, at heart. I mean, wh- wh- which of course is not you know yeah yeah what but. what do they believe in? They believe in capitalism and making money, and these guys aren't doing a good job, so let's fire them. I mean, of course, and and that that is the reality, and that would would also make a great and probably legitimately interesting movie. The thing is, like you can, you could make a good movie where that actually still is sort of the core arc is showing how Gene and Paul overcame is the arc of Kiss. Like that that is the overall arc of Kiss is Gene and Paul overcoming and Ace and Peter being fuck ups. Like that is the at- come down. That yeah. is the arc. But I think that. Um, the arc, if they if they have Gene and Paul write it, they're not going to expose the f- the flaws of Gene and Paul, and I oh, think that not. would yeah. make it a less interesting film. Like, if you see like perhaps the downsides to um, you know Gene's sex addiction. Um, oh yeah, of course. The, and and also I, I think Paul's insecurities. I, I mean, like Paul would ultimately be the main character of the film. He has to be. He would um, have to be. Because he is the emotional core of Kiss and is actually likable, so like Paul has to be the main. I don't know. I came out of his. I came out of Face the Music like not knowing where I stood with Paul. I think that if the book was maybe written at a time when he was a little bit more bitter, but also like I'm considering the gestalt of all Paul Stanley. The book, yeah. interviews over the years, his Twitter feed recently, where he's a reasonable human being. I've been loving recent uh, uh, Twitter Paul Stanley, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I would say that overall, like, Paul is a flawed person, as are all humans. But yeah. I think of the members of KISS, he is the one who has, you know, the best head on his shoulders. Um, mm. You know, th- th- I think he's probably like, you know, he might be a little bit catty, but I think is ultimately like a good person at heart. Yeah. And uh, I think he doesn't have the same ego that Gene has. Like, Gene as a main character would just be a terrible main character for a film, like a protagonist you want to root for. <laughs> oh, I think his story... Oh, yeah. Like, I mean, his, his story, his early days, yes, but then as, like, he becomes who he is. Yeah, um, like... Versus the arc of, like, Paul being insecure and then finding a way to, like, be a confident person uh, and developing a true friendship... Um, you know, or, uh, you know, at, although Gene's the only one who thinks they're friends, uh, which is the, the great part. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I really, I mean, honestly, if they were going to do a kiss movie, my bet is that it would only go as far as alive. Like I, I don't, I don't expect to see a kiss film that would you know, A, I don't expect to see a Kiss film, period. B, I don't expect to see one that, uh, you know, goes all the way from 73 to t- 2023. They, they, could, they could end it alive, too. Okay, yeah. Well, but I feel like... I, I feel like once you get past, like, alive... I think the, the thing is, Gene and Paul would want some of the movie to be when they're on top of the world, in the arenas with their hits because yeah. i think just ending out alive like they want to have enough of the movie where you can relish them being on top of the world yeah uh, okay that's a good point 
And you well, know, then, because if you just get to a live, there's not a single kiss lunchbox in the movie. Oh, that's a good point. You don't well, but, you but, don't get to see the scene of them dripping their blood into the ink with Stan Lee. Yeah. Like you know they'd want that in there. They'd want all those big highlights from the peak of their heyday. Well, but that that would be the scene at the end as Rock and Roll All Night is playing. It's it's them no, cutting. No, they 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 they'd want to savor that in the film. You know they would. They wouldn't want to just yeah, end that live. Because if it's all just them living in a van the whole movie. Yeah. You think that they're gonna make a kiss movie where they don't show? Then we got really successful and all got with Playboy Playmates. Like you think they're not gonna? <laughs> and also, even <laughs> even from like a marketing perspective, like. What do the people making biopics want? They want them at the height of their powers when they're doing all the debauch stuff. Ah, That's a good point, yeah. So, bare minimum, it would go to, like, the Love Gun tour. Yeah. I say, I say, end it at a really weird spot. End it at Unmasked. (laughs) End it with Unmasked coming out. End it with the recording session for Shandy. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Or the filming of the video. (laughs) <laughs> did you ever see Ed Wood, the Tim Burton film? I did not. Oh, that's that's an amazing uh, uh, biopic. Um, it's. Uh, uh, I mean, I, it's, I, I I I know who Ed Wood is. I know his cultural yeah. significance. I know about yeah. the film. I mean, uh, Tim Burton. He's made three of my favorite movies, so he has that going for him. So I'm not anti Tim Burton. Yeah, I mean, and he's this got is definitely... three home runs in my book and other what, movies. What are they? What are his? If I'm had... assuming Batman. All right, you got huh? one. You got one. Batman. Batman Returns. You got two. Edward Scissorhands. No. Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Uh, no. Uh, the it's original fine. Frank and Weenie short. Never saw it. Uh, that's it's really good. I, there's a dog in it that gets hit with a car. Uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm familiar. I read spoilers. I know things. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, Big Fish. Uh, you know. Good, but not one of my favorites. Mars Attacks. No. See, but we're quickly running out of Tim Burton films that should be considered a home run by anyone. Think like uh, me. Uh, Alice in Wonderland? No, absolutely oh, not. Oh, no. I, it, Planet of the Apes. No. Uh, uh, Sweeney Todd? Yep. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, but Sweet. Okay, Sweeney Todd was good though. I liked. I liked. Sweeney well, Todd. it's a faithful adaption of one of the greatest musicals ever. Yes. Duh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah and the thing is, yeah. like, as far as like, hey, who would be a good director for a film adaption of Sweeney Todd? Yes. Like yeah. that's just like that is a match made in hell right there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But uh, um, I, I would uh, recommend seeing Ed Wood. That's a great. Uh, uh, a great story about just kind of this quirky group of people. And, and especially as a creative person, uh, it's, it's, it's a wonderful film, uh, about creative people. So one, and it, it, oh, I was going to say, and it ends, <laughs> it ends where you need to in the Ed Wood story for it not to be depressing as hell. Right. right. Because he, he got Plan Nine for it, it ends. It ends at the premiere for Plan Nine from Outer Space. Ah, okay. Uh, that is actually then, a bummer that that's where the movie ends because I would love where it just goes into the part where he just like can't make any money in this directing porn and withers away and dies of alcoholism. And, yeah, like and, that's the movie I want to see. Ah, uh, I mean that movie that would be an interesting movie too, Ed especially Wood I don't too, know if you, directed by Tim Burton, starring Johnny Depp. You know he's at the right age. They can do it. Shoot, we need to get <laughs> they on can Twitter. Do it. Yeah. Uh, but sorry, what were you going to say? You said uh, one more Spoil thing? Spoil Hellraiser for me as to why it's cool. Oh, um, it... Like, spoil it. Like, like just just get get to it. Yeah, no, 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 it's... it's, it's... The, the, the characters of the Cenobites, right? So, like, you know, you, I'm sure you've seen the classic yeah. image of Pinhead, yeah, right? Yeah, dude, dude with the pins. Pin people. They're, yeah, they're... Uh, at least for the first movie, right? Hellraiser three through ten are indefensibly straight to video trash. Right, but just like just uh, defend to me, like what is the interesting hook? What yeah. is the hook? The Cenobites are not villains that are out for, uh, uh, like they're they're not intentionally terrorizing groups of people merely to kill them in interesting ways. The thing about them is that they are. 
they, they refer to themselves as uh, uh, explorers in the furthest regions of sensation, I think. So it's it's just all about uh, uh, this this it, it's it's more of like a weird spiritual discovery kind of thing uh, that also has a lot to do with extremely kind of like weird kinky stuff because the guy who wrote it. So it's basically just Manson family. No, oh no, 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 no. No, because like, man, we're killing you, but it's like a spiritual way of killing you, man. No, because they don't kill you. That's the thing. Uh, uh, they're because they're they're they are. The Do they seal the you in another dimension, so man. No, no, they they you're you're in hell. You know, it, it is hell. Oh uh, man, that, but... that's so that's so that's so not being killed. <laughs> But it's 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 this uh, Clive Barker, right? He's the guy who wrote it. Yeah, he wrote it uh, uh, just after he was diagnosed with HIV. Okay. And he didn't get it from like unprotected sex or sharing needles. He got it from sharing hooks at hook suspension uh, play parties. So, and, and he's very much into... What is a hook suspension play? Oh. Oh, you ever see Ichi the Killer, that Japanese movie? No. Oh, okay. Well, have you ever... Yeah, go go Google that one. It's people being hung from ceilings with hooks in their flesh, and, and it, it, it uh, appeases Gee, that, them. Gee, that seems like a good idea. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, hey, I, I'm not going to yuck anyone's yums, but uh, as long as you're doing it safely. Which he wasn't. Uh, which he wasn't, but well, but then again, also, it, you know, who knew that there were? That there, oh my god, be... that's hor- that's horrible. Ah, I'm such a prude. <laughs> but uh, but he so yeah, Hellraiser ultimate. It, it's 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 a story about how how the search for the ultimate can sometimes uh, lead to uh, uh, negative consequences. Only told in this kind of cosmic. Uh, that is that did not sell me on the film. That just sounds like I'm instead so of killing everyone, on the on se- instead of killing everyone, they just go to hell. But, but they're but not bad even, guys for taking them to hell. But that doesn't even really happen in the film as as much. It's 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 uh, uh, Hellraiser is a. You are very bad at selling films to me, sir. It's a cosmic miscommunication. The the plot of Hellraiser. <laughs> It is a it is a weird game of phone tag involving a box. Couldn't you just punch the dude? The pinhead guy? Yeah. Ah, he he probably he probably come a little bit. If you punched him. He's a guy who had spikes driven into his head and and liked it. So you punch him, he's probably going to Well, maybe if you punch him, he'll be happy and satisfied. Oh, he he'll not <laughs> He'll never be satisfied. And also, uh, his name is not Pin- Pinhead. Is is was uh, given to him uh, by the public at large, outside of the movie. In the film, he's only he's never referred to by any name, and he's credited as Head Cenobite or Lead Cenobite. Got it. Yeah. So yeah. So don't uh, don't go thinking you have you have not sold thinking. Hellraiser to me, sir. You I have, know. Um... What if I told you it was it it the book is really good. The that, novella, so you don't that, even have to invest all that much time. It, that, it is, that's, it is that's, a... that's not selling me on that either, because the thing is, like, Steve keeps telling me these, like, you know, cosmic horror books are good and they're not. Oh, well, it's... It's okay. all based upon the premise and interesting world building. Who needs a compelling character? Oh, no, but but, but you have you have compelling characters in Hellraiser. <sighs> You've got, uh... Oh, so, uh... uh... Okay, Andrew You're Robinson. Doing a terrible job with this, Kevin. <laughs> Were you ever a Star Trek DS9 guy? The only Star Trek I've seen is the one where they travel back in time to the eighties to, to kidnap whales. whales. Yes. Yeah, Star Trek Four. That was great. Um, yeah, yeah, it's a great, it's, it's yeah, great movie. Uh, okay, so you wouldn't know the character of Garrick from Deep Space Nine, but the guy who plays Garrick is in it. That helps. As as <laughs> uh, well, I'm trying to think of what else Andrew Robinson has been in other than Star Trek and Hellraiser. And I'm sure he's done a lot, but I can't think of anything. But uh, uh, you're just going to have to trust your old buddy Gavin on this one. Mm. (laughs) When have I I led you wrong? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, 
Remember also, I don't like Gish. Oh, yeah. I mean, Hellra- if, if anything, uh, uh, Hellraiser is the adore of 80s horror films. But I don't like the visual direction of adore. I just like the songs. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's what I mean. So it's just like kind of quiet and moody and very relaxing. Uh, and secretly sad, if you think about it. So like the beginning of Audition. I feel like oh, the beginning of Audition, audition is just a door. Um, <laughs> and that, so wait, you've seen Audition, but you haven't seen Ichi the Killer? Uh, Steve had Audition and, and asked, hey, Greg, do you want to watch this movie with me? It's a movie about sad and lonely people in Japan. It's a slow moving drama. You'll love it. That's kind of the perfect way to go into that movie, though. If you don't know. I knew. I knew. Oh, God damn. OK, because but, watching that film, I really wish I didn't know where it was going to go. Honestly, um, I really liked it until it went where it was gonna go, because like when it was just a a, a like drama, like person a... in the bag. Yeah, basically yeah. once it got to person in the bag, and like ah oh, shit, this is where it's gonna go. Oh, but that ah oh, was so. And the rest of it, I was sincerely invested and thought this is a really good character piece about overcoming grief and moving on to the next stage and sort of the complexities and relationships. And yeah. so I was um really enjoying it. And then it just became what it became. And I'm like, it, it was part of a good movie. <laughs> Did you ever see Antichrist with uh, Willem Dafoe and, and uh, Charlotte Gainsbourg? Is that the thing with like the, 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 the blood and coming out of the penis movie? Uh, I mean, there is a scene where that happens, but I wouldn't define the film as that. Uh, basically, I only know about the movie because uh, someone told me about that scene, and then I just looked up the clip. Oh yeah, I mean that's that scene happens, but there's so much that the great th- that film is is. No, I read a- I read the spoilers. Um, once again, like. Well, but but also, ah, so much of that film is the atmosphere, though. It's a very atmospheric film, right? Like like I like, like story. You- I don't care about the atmosphere. I just want good, compelling character arcs. You, yeah, you have a you have a a, a, a wonderful little char- character study of 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 uh, Willem Dafoe and Charlotte Gainsbourg, whose characters are nameless. Uh, I believe they're just credited as man and woman uh, in the film. That uh, one did seem like I, I'm remembering the synopsis now in my head. That one did seem yeah. like it was better. Of well, all the okay, movies so we've like, discussed, that is the one I'd yeah. be most likely to watch. So, so, like, what are your thoughts on on The Shining? Right, like like The Shining. Um, I'm not that big into Stephen King. Um, so putting that out there. Uh, okay, that's fair. But I feel like the, even if you're not into Stephen King, that movie. I would say The Shining is a good movie. Um, it's a good movie that I don't have any desire to revisit it necessarily. Like, I feel like there's only so much I can get out of that film. Um, yeah, it feels like for a film that like people are supposedly trying to dig a bunch of meaning out of, it feels very one dimensional to me. Well, I mean, I agree that all of these weird interpretations about how it's it's him admitting to faking the moon landing and it's about, you know, but like, uh, it's, it's ultimately just like this is just like the progression of insanity. Yeah, that's it. And, and it's done in such a uh, in, in such a way where nothing in that film is comfortable. It's it's such a study in discomfort, I think, and that's one of the the chief things I love about it. Uh, you know about the movie. I mean, I, I like the story a lot too, and I obviously Jack Nicholson's performance is yeah. is that's, I think that's... and Shelley Duvall. But um, yeah, that's but, a stronger film. I would I would yeah. I would acknowledge that as being good. Um, or like two thousand one. Uh, that was I fell asleep during it. Well, okay understandable but did you then go back and finish it and be like this is like i woke up the best again science fiction films of all I time wo- i woke up and saw the ending and then fell asleep promptly afterwards so well you I know fell what? Asleep while watching like up oh, up oh, and now he's dying will i was does he say will i dream no that's 2010 that's the sequel with the computer when, and they're remember. shutting they're, they're turning Hal off, and, and he says, will, will I dream? Before he, like, sacrifices himself. Oh, 
Um, I, I don't, I don't know that then. Did you secretly watch 2010 and thought you were watching 2001? Yeah, no, and then had no with, idea what was... doesn't it begin with monkeys and like an obelisk? Yeah, that's, yeah, the beginning of 2001. So did you watch them back to back, but fall asleep for the... I don't know, I was at a friend's house. And the beginning of 2010? I was at a friend's house and he was insisting <sighs> that these movies were amazing. Like, man, you have to watch this. Um, look, and that's not to say that, like, he only showed me crappy movies. He showed me Shock Treatment. That was pretty rad. You know, Shock Treatment is, uh, uh not as bad as people say it is. I, I, I don't know if I, if I personally can go as far as to say as I really like it. But I think it's, it's not, it's not the piece of shit that it was initially sold to me as. I, I think that the problem with Shock Treatment is that it is... So, like, it's missing the parts of Rocky Horror that people liked about Rocky Horror. Yeah. And yeah. that's actually kind of an amazing troll, which I think is just actually kind of genius, because the reason people got into Rocky Horror wasn't because they liked campy glam rock riffs, or um, because they liked its sarcastic tape. They, li- they liked its just, like, over-the-top sexuality, and its dark well, and horror aesthetics. It, and, and I think it, it made a lot of great points about, like, sexual freedom and experimentation and, right and, yeah that's what I'm, that. that's it represented what I'm a lot of things yeah yeah but then the second movie was all just like hey we're just gonna double down on like criticizing the suburbs and uh make yeah. it bright and colorful get rid of all the horror aesthetic make it more like a cartoon um and so it's in some ways um yeah you know i i should have realized this at the time but um Part of the idea with uh, Lipstick's formation was to uh, look at other rock bands as Rocky Horror and to treat ourselves as shock treatment. I like that. I like that. Uh, and now our, our abject failure should have been really obvious upon reflection. <laughs> 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 that was the template that we said. <laughs> what if we just like got rid of the stuff that people liked about it and just left the stuff that they were okay with? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I, I think... Yeah, the, the 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 chief problem with shock treatment is that it had characters in it named Brad and Janet. I th- I think they were still largely the same characters suffering intense PTSD from their experience with Doctor Frankenfurter and just going back to suburban life. Oh, and I don't just having a loveless marriage after that uh, is how I, I interpreted it. I I I couldn't see any through point. I, I think it's much. I love the film viewing it through that lens. Of just like they had crazy PTSD begrudgingly got married because they're from the same small town and tried to make it work, but they're just so damaged psychologically from that experience that their just love evaporated and they have just been living this empty husk of a life built only by consumerism. So, wow, that like that simultaneously casts like a negative shadow on the first movie and everything else. (laughs) Yeah. Isn't it great? (laughs) So in that case, I think that Chuck watch it, has watch it through even that more lens. bleak horror aesthetics than the first movie. But it ha- but it doesn't like do it in terms of the visuals. It just doesn't in terms of, like what is real actual horror in terms of yeah. your life. And uh, yeah, so I, mean, I think I, it's it, I, that's what I got out of it, and I'm almost certain that's what they were going for. Um, yeah, I don't what, know. Which, uh, watch it through that lens. Like, watch them back to back and just yeah. imagine, okay, now pretend Brad and Janet had PTSD. They've been together for a few years and just they're living in the suburbs. They've got boring, mundane jobs and just like, you know, are really excited about buying the new blender because that's the only thing they have to look forward in life. But they always will live with the horror of being raped by Dr. Frankenfurter in the back of their mind is eating Eddie's flesh. <laughs> They will forever be... Uh, and remember that they know that aliens the, it, exist it, it, and no one believes them, so they're just living with this trauma and horror. <laughs> yeah, uh, okay. That, I, li- I like this twist on, on shock treatment. I don't think it's that much of a twist. It's just like implying, like, how would these characters have gotten to this point in the last couple years? Why, See, I... why is the life sucked out of Brad and Janet? <laughs> I... I don't know. I almost, I mean, and, and granted it's been uh, maybe a year and a half since I've seen, seen shock treatment. Uh, and I, like, I know Rocky horror inside and out more or less, but, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. I just, I mean, I'll watch it again and I'll try and think of it that way, but I just, I don't, 
I don't think that movie has done any favors by connecting those two, those two films. I, well, I think that's part of the troll aspect of it because you're expecting yeah. like, sweet, we're going to get like more like sexual freedom stuff. And like the fact that you just don't get any of that, I think is awesome. I think, well, you know what the sequel was originally supposed to be. Uh, are you talking about? Um, uh, shoot, what? Go ahead. The name. Well, I didn't. I don't. I know, know if there, there was, was that third one that they started working on, and the demo leaked onto the internet with uh, the song "The Moon Drenched Sores of Transylvania." Oh, I have not heard that. Uh, it's kind of awesome, and is also stylistically not in tune with the other ones, where it's much more dark and gothic. Um, which I suppose makes sense for the time that it would have come out, given Richard O'Brien's sensibilities. Yeah, so I would say it's kind of like, um, so imagine like Sisters of Mercy, but much more mm-hmm. up tempo, bouncy, and fun. Okay, yeah, that's, uh, I, and, I and with, without that. without as much like baritone in the voice, so like a higher pitch singer. Um, yeah, but just like you know, like more bouncy fun sisters of mercy is kind of how I would describe that song. Um, and so like, I think it's awesome. And like Rocky horror fans, like I'm kind of glad this movie didn't get made because the song is shit. Uh, but it's it's much more like (laughs) eighties synthesizer driven, um, Steinman esque, I would say. Mm. Well, I, I believe that the initial plan for the sequel was going to be, uh, uh, Frankenfurter somehow, returning to earth or no, 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 Sorry. Janet is pregnant with presumably Frankenfurter's baby. And he comes back to earth somehow. And that, that supposedly was going to be kind of the, the impetus for the, for the second film. But then none of the cast agreed to it. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And I think it started with Tim Curry, not wanting to, not wanting to, 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 to do it again. Yeah. I mean, well, and also really, I mean, they, they, a lot of the cast couldn't because a lot of the cast died. I guess Frankenfurter even died, so it wouldn't be him coming back to Earth to be him but coming like, back uh, to life. But I know uh, Barry Bostwick and, and um, Susan Sarandon, Sarandon. They, they would have been fine, uh, but they're alive still. Oh yeah, yeah. But uh, what I would say, um, I think that it's, I really like that they took out all the stuff that people liked about the first one and just did that very intentionally. Yeah, that is a pretty Cause masterful... Because it could have just been a real easy softball, just like, oh, we're going to have more kinky sex stuff. That would have been just like a softball. Yeah. But the fact that they just went like, let's just critique the suburbs, but keep the glam boogie rock. <laughs> and put Rick Mail in, uh, in a couple of scenes. Yeah, no, shot treatment, um, cinematic masterpiece. Okay, so <laughs> now that we've done uh, two hours and 46 minutes and made this a proper Rogan podcast. There you <laughs> Is this your longest uh, your longest episode yet? Um, Probably. I mean, the thing is, I'm I like the idea of um, of long form just going however long until it feels right. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I feel like when we did the last one, I was just, it was me like talking too much at the end, which I'm kind of doing now, but I want it to be like more of a mutual thing rather than me just talking about like imperialism being bad, you guys. (laughs) So us mutually talking about how shock treatment isn't as bad feels like a better ending, but I want want to give you one more chance to recommend a movie to me. Okay. Um... Okay, uh, uh, Greg Troyan, I think you should see, uh, hmm, shit, okay, 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 here's a film, here's a film for you, Greg, uh, I'm gonna stay, I'm gonna stick with the lynch train, and, uh, uh, I think <clears throat> you should watch Head. Uh, who's in it? Uh, Jack Nance. No one I know. Okay, so... Yeah. <laughs> uh, someone who was, a uh, 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 Charlotte Stewart, who was also in Little House on the Prairie. <laughs> Sorry, I just remembered our conversation from yesterday. During the Sonic <laughs> thing? Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, all right, so what is, the, what will I get out of it? 
Um, <laughs> well, uh, y y much like in The Empire Strikes Back, uh, much like that little cave thing that Luke goes into, uh, uh, the only thing that you'll find in Eraserhead is what you bring in it with you. All right, that is not a selling point. No, uh, it's a terrible selling point. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it, 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 it's, like, am, uh, am, am I getting um, like a cool set piece? Am I getting a character I care about? Is my life perception going to change in any way? Um, I believe, yes. I think the character of Henry, who is the, the main character, uh, is a, a very interesting character and very strange things happen to him. He, uh, a, he, he goes to dinner at his girlfriend's place and, uh, it is revealed to him that she is, uh, uh pregnant. Okay. Um, and, uh, the, 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 then the, <laughs> then the family kind of has this weird meltdown and the Cornish game hens, that they're eating begin bleeding out of the cavities and uh and then the the grandma drools um but okay uh, you are you are doing a terrible <laughs> job of something. but the, you got the, you got to give you got to give me the hook you got to yeah. give me the hook like when i said rambo 3 dude hangs from wire and then it explodes like i gave you a hook in like 30 seconds you got to give me the hook okay uh uh man who is uh terrorized by uh, weird creature birthed from his girlfriend way early that looks kind of like a weird worm thing uh, terrorizes this guy so badly that uh, he uh, seeks solace in the arms of the weird woman with the blown out cheeks that lives in his radiator. Uh I'm sorry that did not work. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I got, I got, I got that, one more film though. All right, all right. Fun, but you, you basically games. sold and me it, on not wanting to see that at all. <laughs> I'll, I'll send you the trailer. I <laughs> sent uh, the trailer. Yeah. Um. Uh. There's, there's a great horror film, and this isn't a David Lynch film, but it's a horror film. It's called Funny Games. Have you, have you seen it or heard of it? No. Okay, you need I'm to see the original... Happy Death Day. Oh yeah, I am. I heard that 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 first one is supposed to be pretty good, actually. I'm interested um, in that. Yeah. I'm well, interested in movies you aren't recommending me. Uh, well, I haven't seen <laughs> Happy Death Day. <laughs> uh, uh, Funny Games is... Uh, uh, it's, 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 it's See the original German version. Um, or the American version. Because there it was the same director for both. Uh, he just had American actors in the American one. Uh but uh, a German family on vacation, uh, these two very polite uh, uh, boys from a house down the way come uh, to, and ask to borrow sugar and then end up uh, 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 terrorizing this family. And then at a certain point, you realize that this isn't a home invasion film. This film is invading you, and it starts to uh, it starts to play with with, uh, with these very meta concepts of how uh, we react to films and how we feel safe in horror films and 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 how we uh, uh, and and things like that. You know what? That's the one you sold me on the most. So I'll take it. <laughs> Okay, yeah, great. It's a great movie, and it's a very dark movie, but it's a wonderful film. And the name of it one more time. Funny Games. Funny Games. Yeah. All right, well... And, uh, and please, if, if you do me one favor, uh, I've, I've already told you more about the film than you need to know going into it, so any further reading would destroy I'm, I'm doing spoilers you can't stop me from doing spoilers <laughs> oh but but i feel like if you read the big middle spoiler it well no but then again i don't know you you might still enjoy it yeah you, remember who you're talking to like I, yeah i read okay. the spoilers to know if it's worth my time like really that's gonna be like the final selling point like if i think that big middle spoiler is cool I'm watching the movie. If I think it sucks, I'm skipping it. 
Well, I, I can tell you what it is. All right. And I urge anyone listening to this who has not seen it and wants to, or even anyone who hasn't seen it and doesn't know about the film, to skip ahead a couple minutes. Yeah, skip ahead. We're only two hours and 53 minutes in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but at a certain point, the... the uh, uh, after the husband of the family uh overtakes one of the um uh one of the two you know home invader guys and and kills him uh the other one uh says something about how this i forget the line something about how that that this isn't what was or this i forget what he says but something about how that wasn't supposed to happen or whatever and he picks up on the coffee table, a, a, a VCR remote and rewinds the movie. Uh, and so the film that you're watching rewinds back to just before the husband kills the other guy. And then they stop him from doing that. And then the film becomes much more about terrorizing you as a viewer and your expectations, uh, more than this kind of, you know, run of the mill story about like a like a home invasion. Can I just read a choose your own adventure book? Uh well that's that but but well but the the point of this film is that the adventure you you don't get to choose this one. This one has been chosen for you. Oh, so it's powerlessness. Michael. I love that. Well, but but it's also <laughs> no 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 because I'll tell you why. And this is also Can I punch you need the to TV? See film. You can punch the TV, but also uh, uh, in the final scene, they're lecturing you about how if this film makes you sad, it's your fault. <laughs> 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 and that you gave this film the power to do that. Gavin, we just did three hours. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's and the... <laughs> also, I probably need to rewatch it because I may be misinterpreting that, that ending. There, I bet you someone who has made it through all three hours of this is currently screaming at their computer that, that I did not understand funny games in which Probably. case I should rewatch it. I mean, just, but remember like I grew up on like, um, Rocky and dragon ball. So just like, you just punched the bad guy. Well, they tried that. They tried that. But, yeah. And then the film, but I, I didn't try it. Oh, you didn't try it. No. Well, may, maybe you'll find that when this film invades you, you can punch the film away. I mean, you know, there's a part of me that's glad I'm at a point in my life where all my problems can't be solved by punching. Yeah. But I do have nostalgia for those days when almost all of my problems were both uh, caused and solved by just punching. By punching? That's funny. <laughs> ah, good times, great oldies. Mm. All right, this episode brought to you by Funny Games. Bye, everyone. Woo!